I see my PJ come off the side and he's got his star up and he just starts dumping. And I'm like, what the hell? So I'm looking and I'm like, what are you shooting at, dude? What are you shooting at? And he's like, dude, squirter, off the objective, AK-47, he's down. As soon as I'm looking at him, I look back up at the wall and I'm seeing this compound. And not all the time, but sometimes if you get the light right, you can see reflection off PBS uh, 14s or 15s or, or something like not night vision devices. So I look up over this and I can see a couple of night vision devices looking back at me and I'm like, my, I don't think the other birds have landed yet. These aren't my guys. So I get on the radio and I'm like, they've got nods, they've got nods. And all of a sudden, everything opens up. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of former Special Forces Green Beret, Eric Neal. In fact, you'll hear many combat stories in this episode as Eric recounts his four deployments to Afghanistan in just four years from 2010 to 2014 in very kinetic environments with 3rd Special Forces Group, losing many friends and brothers in arms along the way and learning so much about himself. Even Eric's very first combat operation, which we jump into in the first two minutes of this episode, was as chaotic as they get, with multiple aircraft stacked above him, supporting his ODA going Winchester or running out of ammo, trying to suppress the enemy. He would be involved in operations we've heard of previously, in one case carrying the bodies of the soldiers we lost in Extortion 17, and many events we have not heard of, to include one of the largest VB IEDs in the post-9-11 era on the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 that wounded over 70 soldiers and local nationals. Eric experienced so much of this combat and loss in his mid-20s, and as he mentions, some of these moments are still with him today, and it's not hard to understand why. It is hard to imagine one person could experience this much combat in one lifetime, let alone in just four years, and I hope you enjoy this gauntlet of trial by fire, literally, and the combat operations and insights he shares as much as I did. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Yeah, no problem, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So we were uh, connected by Daryl Utt, who a lot of folks on this program will know. We've interviewed him, and he's he's connected us with several folks. Um, pretty interesting background that he has and the work he's doing now with the National Medal of Honor Museum. And I know you are involved in helping with that to some degree as well. I was just curious if you could share with people, like, what's your background with Daryl? How do you two know each other? Uh, yeah, so uh, through the Special Forces Foundation, actually, their director, um, Ignacio Garza, um, is a good buddy of ours. Um, it was just a natural progression. As soon as I had gotten into the civilian sector, um, knowing a, a lot of served with three of the recipients, the Green Beret recipients, um, and I was like, hey, we need to do something with these guys. It just so happened that there was an Indy car race uh, not too long ago, actually. And um, I linked up and he said, uh, Iggy, the SFF guy, was like, hey, we got Daryl here from the National Motor Wonder Museum. I was like, thanks. Thanks for the hookup, buddy. Um, so it was just, he was a 10th group guy, third group guy. It was a natural progression. And so we got some absolutely amazing stuff planned between um, our company, Gritter, Webby Corp and the National Metal of Honor Museum here in the next year, year and a half. So stay tuned. That's awesome. And did I hear you correctly that you served with three Medal of Honor recipients? Yeah. So uh, the most recent Green Beret, I believe Plumley, his name was a first group guy, but the previous three were all from my battalion. So um, Robbie Miller um, was from ACO that I served in. Um, me and Robbie went to the Q course together. And then Ron Scher and Matt Williams from 3236 Seco um, were in my company when I served as well. So, Jeez. yeah. Let, let me ask you this. I had the opportunity to, to hang out with Giants. It was That's incredible. incredible. Um, obviously, when you're going through the Q course, they're just another guy, right? And now, as you mentioned, they're Giants. Is there anything like having known three of them where you're like, wow, maybe I should have seen that coming. I'm not surprised that, that they would have done something like this to get that award. Um, so I think even they would say most Medal of Honor recipients, um, obviously there are certain missions that are like that stand out, you know, yeah. the Valley one, um, where a third group got uh, two recipients out of 
um, was it was definitely one of those missions. Um, but they're the most humble guys, especially you know, Matt Williams is the only uh, surviving um, third group recipient, and he's one of the most humble guys ever. Um, and they they they're unique individuals, obviously. But I don't know if you could say like, hey, they're any more unique than anybody else. The circumstances put them in the position to do what they've always trained to do, and they went above and beyond. Um, what is required of, of individuals. And I know that Matt and other guys would say there's been plenty of dudes in situations that probably deserve the Medal of Honor, and maybe we just need to wait for their time to, to come. So Yeah. We had uh, David Bellavia on here, another recipient, um, yeah. conventional guy. and Amazing order. <laughs> just amazing. I mean, he's so humble, and he's like, could have been anybody, just happened to be me, and – I, th I think it's easy to say that, but it, it just really like I could sense it in him. He, he just was like, I don't know why this is me, but, you know, appreciative of it at the same well, time. No one wants it. You know, yeah, what I mean? that's what he said. Oh. He's like, I, I don't know if I'd want this again. Like it, it, the responsibility that comes with it is pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, You know, as you mentioned, third group, it's it, it's funny. It's almost like you've got this strong connection to that group, not just the SF community. Um, how important is that particular group that you're a part of to you? So uh, for me in particular, just because I was all Afghanistan. So I never even got any j sets <laughs> to Africa. I never signed <laughs> up. It was purely combat for me. I'm a little sour about that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, third group, we, we had the brunt of, of it, you know, and all the other groups will admit it. Um, now, don't don't get me wrong. Like, everyone is getting after it over there. Um, but as far as, I mean, we changed our whole AOR, you know, from Africa to Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, of course, I love third group, but I've worked with and got buddies in all the other groups, you know, fifth, tenth. If it was a different time, you know, I would have loved tenth. You know, they get to do some super awesome missions over in Europe and, and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, it just wasn't my experience. Mine was purely combat. So yeah, uh, I'm a third group guy through and through. Um, and I'm proud of it. You know, we yeah. saw a lot of combat and a lot of camaraderie and, and all that. And that will last us, you know, as a group, but all the whole brotherhood, the SF regiment through throughout the future. Yeah. I, I've got a special place in my heart for third group. Um, I grew up in Africa for a while, so I just kind of have that affiliation. But when I was in Afghanistan, the SF unit that we ended up working very closely with was third group. And you know, for whatever reason, um, like you said, they spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. And they just knew that place inside and out. Yeah. Um, I was struck as we were preparing for this by your first combat experience. And I actually thought we should start there because it's, it's as rowdy as they get, man. It's a wild ride, man. <laughs> so I was hoping you could share that one with us before we take a, a trip back to you as as growing up and getting into the military. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll break down my first deployment. I actually arrived like January 1st, 2010. Um, and as we landed, one of our ODAs that had been there previously, um, 3336, was doing some something was happening in Kabul. It was a big deal. A bunch of terrorists had come in and taken over like the Ministry of Interior building. It was a massive, hellacious gunfight. And so as I was landing, they were like, "Yeah, get your shit. You're going to Kabul." I was like, "Okay, <laughs> let me. Sl I'm on Ambien right now. Like, let me <laughs> let me get a couple hours here." Um. So yeah, it was just a wild ride from the start. And so we ended up going out to uh, Camp Moorhead in Kabul, which is your uh, Sixth Kandak is the main effort at that time, which is your national mission force. And that Kandak is an Afghan, it's basically a battalion, an Afghan battalion. Um, so they have special operations battalions there. And Sixth Kandak was there. And my ODA was tasked with standing up Afghanistan's first real tier one counterterrorism uh, mission, Afghan National Army Special Forces. So everything that has to do with it you know recruiting the guys um selection and assessment it was like a mini sfas um and uh yeah we got these guys um trained up which is kind of uh, our main part but without having a combat specific role as an oda um and there was two other odas at camp moorhead running operations out of there at the same time you as a young guy or as an Echo or an 18 Delta, you'd get attached to these teams. 
So on this particular mission, uh, it was my very first combat mission. I think I was probably two weeks into country. And mind you, the only thing I had done as a Green Beret before this was an NTC rotation training the UAE, you know, soft guys or whatever. Um, so yeah, but I was stoked for it, you know, super yeah. prepared. Um, so Objective Gecko was the name of it. It was um, a couple of villages that were um, bisected by a ridge line. Um, so it was um, in Logman province, right off the border from Nuristan. An ODA had gotten roughed up the day beforehand, so we're going to kind of come in and teach them a lesson. And um, yeah, I believe it was four Chinooks, a whole company of commandos, um, and that one ODA plus um plus guys from other teams so um yeah we get in it was obviously a nighttime infill and we're flying for a good while and this time like i'd spent a hellacious amount of time in uh the q course my q course experience was the worst it was like three Why? And a half years three and a half happened? years of training um well, well after the, yeah after this okay we'll, we'll, we'll come back yep um so as an echo, like on the on the 47s, like you can hook comms up in there and, and tie in and talk to um, the crew and all that. So as we're coming around, I know we're about 15 minutes out. Um, there's little bubble windows and I'm kind of looking out, but it's dark out so I can't see anything. Um, and then I hear we're on final, we're coming in. And then um, as a new guy, I'm hearing aircraft chatter and all that. They say cherry ice. I'm like, I'm pretty sure cherry ice is something they do if things are going wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure there's bad guys there. So we're like loitering, you know, around this objective. I'm like, this can't be good. And I'm, I'm seeing out the window, I'm looking out and I can see like little flashes of light. Um, and everything's quiet on comms and we're just sitting up in the air, it seems like. So I'm like, okay, something is up here. We ended up banking hard right and landing at what I found out later was an alternate HLZ. Um, so at this point, I'm like, okay, stuff's going crazy. I'm doing a head count on my commandos, making sure that they're all good. As soon as we hit down, I'm like, okay, obviously we engage targets on the LZ. We're going to get stitched up as we're coming. And I'm thinking worst case, Roberts Ridge. <laughs> like, That's what you think case. though, right? Your first yeah. time outside yeah. the wire. Yeah. hundred percent. So we get out and I'm like, I'm up right on the, the tail of the bird. So I run out and like find some cover and I get down, I'm like in the prone position, you know, like wait on guns and I look back at the helicopter and these guys are just like popping off the ramp and like <laughs> <walking> <laughs> okay well i'm being a little bit intense right now i mean that's kind of what it's like with command is you're you're hurting cats you know and don't get me wrong some of these guys um that's what they've been doing their whole lives you know is combat so they've got this complacency set in um and all that for the most part and um, yeah, so my first combat experience getting off the helicopter, thinking we're getting it stitched up and all that was like super anticlimactic. Um, and then I was like, okay, situational awareness, right? Tactical pause. All right. So that was the first, my first combat mission was like, hey, this is what the pros do. Like, hey, let's get down, let's see where we're at. We're on a new HLZ. So now we need to figure out where everything is. Um, yeah. And so one of the funniest parts about it is as soon as I, you know, get my team together and I got my interpreter with me. It was me and maybe, I don't know, like a half squad of nine guys or so. And we were tasked with clearing probably 25 to 30 buildings on one side of the river as you go down this valley. And I'm like, all right, let's go stay with me. And like 15 feet into it, I'm like hard charging. And I don't see like this roof line. Look, the terrain's crazy. You got tiers and buildings are on cliffs and, and all kinds of stuff. And I just, right off of this roof line, completely no. tall, nods fly off my helmet. I seen white, like it was a bad fall. And so no one was laughing immediately because they like, I disappeared off the side of this <laughs> thing. So I'm sure they like ran up to the edge like, Neil, are you okay dude? Like what's going on? And I'm embarrassed as hell, my Afghanis had to pick me up up off the roof. <laughs> get back on. And then the guys got on the radio because they saw it and they were giving me, welcome to combat, Eric. Um, so yeah, that's how that, this first mission really started off was just me being way outside of my knowledge base at the time, even though I've been training for years to do this. I mean, once you get there, you know, it's yeah. like, it's really not what you would anticipate it to be like. So yeah, we ended up clearing all the way through. Um, I think as soon as daylight happened, um, was when the sniper first 
uh, started letting himself be known. He got one of our commandos on a rooftop. I'm not sure the distance, probably 300 yards, 40 yards, nothing crazy. Um, got one of those guys. And then we were pretty much pinned down um, for a while until we could figure out where he was. Um, so, and I'll, I'll get some footage for you on Google Earth about uh, where this was. But awesome. um, so we occupied a school and I got the video of the JDAM getting dropped after all the aided teams were Winchester. So there's a school like 127 yards away, right? So we identified where this guy's shooting from. So we're like, hey, let's have 64s hit it, you know, with, I think it's, was it 30 millimeter or 20? Yep. 30. Either way. Yep. So yeah, they're, they're hitting it. Winchester on the guns. So they start going hellfires, completely get out of hellfire. Um, I think another team came in, tried to do it again. This guy's still hitting our commandos, by the this way. This is all going after the sniper. Eric. It's all just one sniper, and it's a like large cave mountaintop peak. And it's like a movie, man. You'd see it looked like something from Lord of the Rings where, like, you're going to have a guy with a white beard and a robe on top, like, <laughs> being in the army or something. But there was a little sniper fighting position at the base of this hill, and this is where he was shooting us from. So we couldn't get the Hellfires in there. We couldn't get the 30s in there. He must have been way back in the cave, like, shooting. Um, yeah. So anyways, they're like, hey, Neil, we're going to have to drop bombs. It might have been bones or something, B1s. Um, what's your distance from the sniper, right? So I, as an Echo, a combo guy, I've got SATCOM up. I've got the birds going. I can hear everything that's going on, right? So now, mind you, I'm attached to this team. <laughs> I'm the new guy, <laughs> uh, right? And so they're like, hey, what's your distance from um, the sniper position? I look out, I got the range finder, and it says 127 meters, right? So I'm like, hey, I'm 127 out. They're like, okay, got it. I hear him switch over to like 102 to like gain uh, drop approval. And he's like, yeah, friendly force is 600 meters out. And I'm like, oh, we're about to do something serious here. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, you got approval, blah, blah, blah. Come on over there. They call, tell them to call Iridium, Iridium phone, which I know. You know, something serious happens when you go on sat phone. And then they come back on the cons with me and they're like, hey, go to the back of the school, get all the commandos, lay down, keep your mouth open. <laughs> we got a 2,000 pound GBU coming, you know, 127 meters off. So like, and they, oh, they reported the 600 meter distance so they could probably get approval yeah. to drop something yeah. of this yeah. size. So at this time, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't as bad as it had gotten on, on previous deployments, but they were really reluctant to drop. Um, because, well, this is the thing. So the school structure, you weren't able to get drop authority if you were within, I think it was like 300 meters of a structure. And the structure that was within 300 meters was me, but it was a school that wasn't being occupied. It was still under construction and all that. Um, so like, I get it. And, and I think I may have said, yeah, I'm good. Go ahead. You know, yeah. something like that. So this is towards the end of the day. And we'd already done a few clearing operations. So. Apaches have completely, you know, run out of options at this point. So we got a 2,000 pounder coming in hot, and this thing goes off 127 yards away, knocks down the whole first half of the school. So if we were like on that side of the building, it would have been a bad day. So now, mind you, I've got my interpreter with me, but I don't, I don't really, I just my first off with these dudes. So I'm trying to tell them, like, hey, ah, you know, explosion, you know, going off, like, put your headphones on and all that. Well, these guys didn't know, or some of them didn't know the bomb was going off at the time. So obviously they ended up freaking out. But um, yeah, that ended up only shearing off the entire face of the cliff. Like the 2000 pounder sheared the face off. And when it came down, the tunnel kept going further into the mountain. So um, we ended up having to get a couple of guys to go in there with some thermal barracks. And we had, I mean, imagine like four or five different, you know, support by fire positions probably 200 meters away from this thing at this point. And you got one guy that volunteered. That's crazy. So <laughs> It's like a tunnel rack. Yeah. And you can see this little guy walking up the hill and you got like a bunch of guys like, Hey, if anyone pops out of this, we're going to have to shoot this guy before this, uh, as that dude gets whacked. But, um, yeah, Colin Murphy, my senior, uh, at go volunteered to drop the thermal in there. And, um, yeah, we took out that position, but for a first mission, and it was like a, a multi-day as well, um, was just everything I'd ever wanted. 
Um, no American casualties. Obviously, the commandos being lost was was bad, uh, but as I would learn in the future, that happens a lot. Um, yeah, so it was just it was it was awesome, man. It was incredible, and uh, yeah, Spectre gunship was the the aircraft lighting up our primary HLZ, which I found out like midway through the next day. Um, and yeah, I had yet to on all my deployments after that. Um, I think we may have Spectre support us. I mean, we had a bunch of Spectre support, but actually, like, going guns on uh, maybe a handful of times. So, yeah, mission yeah. for me was pretty awesome. Um, matter of fact, on the exfil out from that mission, we were flying over um, a really bad area, and we had our dog next to us, and the dog's name is Marco, really famous soft NPC, Special Operations Force, multi-purpose canine. And he was resting his head on my foot, and we got stitched up by a PCAM or something flying over. And the round, I'll send you some pictures. So the round hit right in between Marco's head and my boot and hit my foot. Went right in between the two hydraulic lines in the Chinook. And we had to do an emergency landing at Z-Hawk base. Um, I forget where that is, but somewhere in RC East. So yeah, I mean, from the beginning of getting prepped, the mission, then even leaving the mission, and so from that point forward, I always sat with some body armor under my ass whenever I was on the helicopter. So, oh man. Just a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll get right back to this combat story. As you know, I live in California where we can have earthquakes and fires, and I grew up in Florida with hurricanes. I know firsthand how natural disasters can quickly and unexpectedly put me and my family in a position where we have to hunker down, shelter in place, and sometimes without power, so I always want to have food available. You can create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots survival food kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years, super survival food. Handpicked right in a family-owned facility in the U.S., giving jobs to over 200 Americans, which we love. The kits are compact, sturdy, water-resistant, and stack easily. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, you can go to 4 and use the code COMBAT to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including their three-month survival kit. You'll get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97. They're called 4 Patriots because a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Just go to 4 and use COMBAT to get 10% off. That's the number 4, Patriots.com. Use the code COMBAT and start building your own stockpile today. And now, back to this combat story. Dude, I can't even imagine that being the first one out of the gates. Like that, whenever you got back, were you just like, I got years of this coming, man. Like, yeah, well, I'm going to get so, my head wrapped around it. But that's the thing, man. Like, I didn't think I had years. Like my whole time yeah. going through training and all that, all the instructors and everyone that had already been there is like, oh man, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss the war. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that was always my constant fear. If I had gone to another another group, maybe I, well, I know I wouldn't have gotten so many deployments to combat for sure. You know, because I think fifth was like my, my group of choice at the time, just because Iraq was so hot and heavy. But that was done by 12, and I did three more with third after that. So it all ended up working out pretty good. <laughs> but yeah, I got my cherry pop pretty good on the first one. That's a great one, man. Jeez. And am I understanding you correctly? Were you in there almost like a singleton being dropped into a, a team that was already there? Or did you rotate in as a team? Yeah, yeah. So it was our, our battalion. You rotated as a battalion. You rotated in, right? Yeah. Yes, But there was a couple teams that were at Moorhead running the commando operation. We were doing the ANASF stand up thing. And so I think at that time, there was no such thing as like 12 guys on an ODA. We might have had like one team in our company that had 12. And so if you got one Delta or a medic, you've got one Echo, you're going to grab other you know, guys from the teams. And so that's what we did that whole trip. So I think we went on, my ODA went on almost all of the commando operations, at least a few of us. Um, and then eventually we ended up actually operating with our ASF for the first time, which was not intended to happen. Um, but we had some Navy guys get kidnapped um, and had to go find them. But Jeez. yeah, mission one was, was awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. All right. So I guess then now if we kind of hop in a time machine and go back, um, where is it in your life that you figure out like, Hey, I want to go do this army thing. Where does it come from for you? Uh, my family would say I was predetermined by God 
Um, <laughs> as a kid, that's so I grew up without a dad. My dad died of cancer when I was two years old. Um, so like I always, I guess, yearn for a father figure, that machismo guy type thing. Um, was intriguing to me. So Arnold Schwarzenegger and Commando and Predator and like all oh, your normal 80s kid, but compound that with, you know, having a night shift nurse mom for 14 years of your life. Like I was really attracted to the man, like, hey, this is what men do type thing. Um, the military, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was a kid, to be honest. I knew I liked sports. I knew I liked pushing myself. I knew I liked to be associated with that group of guys that were athletic and A-type. Um, and all that, it was just naturally where I fit. I think when I first realized that the military was an option was, um, right after nine 11. Um, so I was a freshman in high school and a half, and I still remember everything about it. Um, but by 2005, when I was getting out of high school, you're seeing all this stuff on CNN, like the invasion of Iraq, all this stuff. And like, these are guys my age getting it, doing something yeah. their lives. And then they're, they're setting themselves up for success later. But like my big thing, I had some grandiose, I wanted to be that guy with a thousand yard stare. I wanted to be grandpa that has stories to tell or something. I don't know where that came from, but I always wanted that to set myself apart from the rest of the population through experience, you know? And the best way to do that, I mean, call me lucky, you know, we had a global war on terrorism, you know, that's probably a terrible mindset to have, but, um, but I really do feel myself I feel like I'm lucky having that opportunity to go over there and do this thing that I really didn't know that I'd been training for since I was a little kid, you know, from all day long, you're out there with your cousins and everything playing guns and, and all that. Um, and as soon as I started really uh, challenging myself in football and sports and all that and realized that all my friends were going off to college, I enjoyed partying too much. So that wasn't really an option. For me, and I just kind of felt like I was being left behind, man. And that coupled with, you know, this drive as a kid and the war going on, I was like, this makes sense. Like, as soon as I actually focused on it, I was like, this is it. I, it was like a light bulb went off. This is my calling. I think I watched Black Hawk down like a million oh, times. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, but I also was very ignorant to the military. I didn't know... And I knew there were some Delta Force guys, um, but I didn't know the difference between like Airborne Ranger uh, Regiment versus Airborne Infantry. So I was like, hey, the quickest way I can get in the action is Airborne Infantry, right? Um, yeah, and that's what I came in as. So. Jeez. Did, uh, did you have any siblings? Because you mentioned kind of grew up with single mom. Yeah, I had an older brother, five years older. Um, so... He basically raised me. My mom was working night shift. Um, yeah. I grew up quick, right? Obviously, as a high school kid, mom is gone. There's parties yeah. all the time. So that was me. And a lot of my friends were five years older growing up. Um, so I grew up quick. I experienced a lot of things, probably five years younger than a lot of people. Um, and But I always I look back at it now, and it's a benefit. 100%. Yeah. Did your brother end up going into the military or no? No. So my brother... So he was more of the mindset, grunge, 90s, like government. Oh, yeah. 80s. You know, like, you really want to, like, be told what to do all the time? I remember having a conversation with me. He's like, you sure, man? Like, he was always down because we were always playing guns. He And later on, you know, nowadays, there's the whole, like, man, I wish I, you know, would have yeah. been able to do that and all that. But at the time, I, he was, I always had a super supportive family. They just wanted to make sure I thought this through. You know, I remember when I made the decision that we're having a, a family get together at my uncle's house and I had them all at the dinner table and I told them like, hey, I'm going. And this was at like the height of the war. A lot of people were dying. It was six. Yeah. Nine, and they did not like it. Um, but they also knew that I had yet to, as a man, say, this is what I'm doing. You know, and they hadn't seen that drive and determination before. So my mom was just like, hey, get right with God. And we support you 100%. My brother, obviously, we're super close. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my childhood and everything was great, man. It was great. I'm just trying to imagine your mom having lost, you know, your dad early on. And then she's got these two sons. And at the height of the war, like you're talking 06, things yeah. are just really getting hot. And then, you know, her youngest is like, hey, I'm 
I'm going to go do this thing. Yeah. There's many a crying conversations with her. Um, that was really rough. You know, now I think about it, I got goosebumps and all, yeah. you know, she had had a whole lot of loss in her life before my aunt was murdered when she was in high school and all that. And my dad Jeez. died of cancer. Right. So, and she did was an oncology nurse. So when I was a kid, she went back to school to be an oncology nurse. Um, and then I remember as a kid hanging out at the pediatric oncology Valley children's hospital, and she would have me hanging out with these kids while they're terminal. No way. So, yeah. So like a lot of these kids that I hung out with, like I knew they were dying. And she used to travel the, the country and speak to people about loss uh, from cancer. So she like understands death. Um, so yeah, she was obviously terrified and all that, but um, luckily things worked out okay for me. Okay. Oh man. Yeah. The perspective you must've gotten being this kid around that pediatric ward had to have been life altering. Jeez. Um, you mentioned sports and football. And I, I do recall reading something about some Navy SEAL who comes who comes along. Can you share this story yeah. with us? So, so it's a mystery, right? It's still a mystery to this day. So this guy, my football coach. So this is the first time I was ever introduced to being sugar cookie. I didn't know that he was hazing me. <laughs> wait, wait, what is sugar cookie? So a sugar cookie is when you're really wet and sweaty and you find some sand or dirt or anything that can get coated on you. Uh, and you roll around um, to no end to try and cut yourself, you know, thoroughly with some type of very uncomfortable substance, typically sand. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the whole time I remember there was like some mysticism between Lloyd Ramirez, right? Lloyd Ramirez was his name. He ended up working for a uh, pinnacle body armor that did dragon skin. But you remember that body armor a yeah. long time ago? Um, so that was out of Fresno. Um, and he did some intelligence work. And he was word on the street was he's a Navy SEAL. And like at uh at practice wear a fanny pack, and everyone's like, Oh, he's got a gun in there. He's got a Glock 19 in his fanny pack. <laughs> well, anyways, he would say stuff, and and I shit you not. When I was going through selection, the stuff that he was having me do in the military or or that I was doing in high school was the exact same stuff. So uh, there's gotta be something there. He ended up being in the intelligence. So um, to me, this was a Navy SEAL. He's training me to be the best man ever, right? And um, yeah, I felt strong. You know, I felt like like I'm getting you know something out of this. He's giving me something that you know only Navy SEALs can know and all that. And so I was super intrigued by you know that community from that. I have no idea this day if he actually was. Oh um, man, maybe I'll do some research. I don't know, dude. Well, I want to know. It doesn't this matter at this point, but. Um, oh. yeah. Yeah, he ended up dying in 2011, um, and uh, I was on deployment when it happened. I, I should have went back for that if I would have had the opportunity, but yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty funny. I used to, and now that I know what he was doing, it was like, come on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he was smoking the shit out of us. I mean, to be honest, I attribute that to me being able to get through selection. Um, the resilience that I, that I found out, I mean, you were puking almost yeah. every day at football practice. Um, and unfortunately... I don't know if I can say unfortunately, but nowadays, like if, if I had an experience that as a kid, I don't know if I would have been as successful going through special operations training. You know what I mean? I get a lot of young guys that try and, you know, ask me, Hey, how can I prep for SF or something? You know? And, uh, one of the big things I say is put yourself in a situation where you want to go and get into a warm bed. You know, get really cold. You know, you want to gut your check yourself before you go. Um, because you definitely don't want to be there. You'll convince yourself that you don't want to do this. You'll convince yourself that there's another opportunity. So learning how to suck is probably important. I love that. So so basically, like, go find a situation that's so bad. All you want to do is go, like, curl go up in, in the your rain, bed. dude. Go sleep outside in the rain all night long. And if you're cool with it, then you're gay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um... You know, it's funny, as you mentioned, this Lloyd Ramirez character, I feel like I've heard a very similar story of this guy who's like a coach somewhere um, from another guy that I interviewed. I can't put my name, put it, put a name on it yet, but everybody's got one, <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's not uncommon, you know, like I think former military guys probably get into football and probably came from those ranks. Anyway, you kind of gravitate back there. And I do, I remember doing bull in the ring, these these different uh, drills, Oklahoma drills and getting smoked and not getting water like back in the day. 
And it's helpful later on when you're getting pushed. Yeah. As long as you don't die. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. It's a it's a fine line. Yeah. <laughs> How given the mystique around this character, was there some draw for you to go the Navy route to be a SEAL? I mean, I think everyone I mean, you got the Navy SEAL movie, you know, and all that. Everyone wanted to be, you know, this is God. Um, thermal camera, you know, shoot past the wall. You know, a five minute long free fall scene out of a C one thirty. Like everyone wants to do that. Um, but to be honest, I had low confidence, man. Uh, when I really think about it, like I didn't maybe I didn't uh, push that off. Like the perception of me was someone with high confidence because that's how I carried myself. But I did not see myself having the capability to go SF or Navy SEAL. Um, I really I didn't even research it. Um, I didn't even know there was an eighteen X ray program. Um, so I was like, hey, let me just go be 11 Bravo, Airborne Infantry, um, do my part. And um, that's what I did. In basic, they actually gave me the opportunity to transfer over to 18 X-Ray. Um, wow. So I actually had, um, this was uh, 06, I went to basic. And um, just 11 Bravo, everything was fine. Everything was great. Got orders to 173rd, Vincenzo, Italy. I had a girl that I was dating at the time. I was like, Italy. Life is good. Oh, yeah, let's let's go. Um, mind you, I would have been on the Restrepo um uh, unit that was over there, so that would have been a lot of fun. Um, but right after I got my orders, they gave me the opportunity. They said, Hey, you can go rip at the time, is what it was called, um, or you can go SF. And I was like, SF is way at this time it was like old guys that had been serving for like 10 years like i just i didn't see myself as that although i wanted to be my confidence level was nothing so i said hey i'm gonna go ranger and my senior drill sergeant at the time sergeant first class a lot and i wish i could find out where he is now um said uh no you're gonna go sf if you don't one of these two is harder to get into you know what I mean? Like a tryout with SF, not a lot of guys get this spot. If you don't do it there, maybe try and get a rip, you know, contract or try 41, 4187, whatever it is, um, over there. And so that's what I was like, sure. You know what I mean? Like, what? tell me what to do, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's about four of us. And yeah, that's all she wrote, man. Uh, me and four guys went for my basic training. We made it all the way through. We're friends to this day. Um, yeah, super duper stellar guys. They went to a uh, tenth group, but, um, yeah. So transfer to 18 extra right there, told the, uh, the soon to be ex-wife, Hey, we're not going to Italy. Uh, we're going to Fayetteville. Good news. <laughs> North Carolina. Um, yeah. So she was obviously super excited about moving to North Carolina. <laughs> really. Um, yeah. And then the Q course was just. Three and a half years. It was the worst Q course experience of anyone that I've ever met or ever talked to. Jeez. Um, hold, hold on that for just a sec. Cause I, I'm curious, like what a pivotal moment for you, like deciding between the SF route and rip, it's not like either is easy, yeah. but it's a very different life that you would have had. Right. I'm curious. Did you seek out, like, were you actively asking, Hey, what should I go do? Or did this person just come to you and say, Hey, I know you're weighing this and you need to go do this. Yeah, that was that. Yeah, the drill sergeant pulled us in and they were like, listen, there's this opportunity for you guys to go change your MOS to something different. I strongly suggest that you do it. Um, and I didn't even know this was a huge deal for me. For one, I'm, do I give up Italy? Yeah. Something I don't think I can do. And if I fail, you're going to go to freaking the East or Polk or South <laughs> Pole, or it could be anywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was like, man, um, but I don't know, maybe it was a young, young part of me. I've always been the guy to, to reach high, you know, and I don't see things as, as unachievable um, regularly. There's things that are, I'm not going to do because I know I can't do it. But for some reason, I was like, you know what, why not? What else do I have to lose here? You know, I've already been in training. Um, yeah. And then God, I did it, man. Um, I couldn't imagine my life any other way without it. So yeah, the drill sergeant told me to do it, and I did it. Um, if he would have gave me the option, maybe I would have said no, to be honest. That's how yeah. well I, You just said I, go I, do I, it. I, yeah, yeah. If you're interested in getting some Combat Story merch, 
like what you see on the show, you can go to bonfire.com slash store slash combat story. And we've got a few different variations on there and we'll be adding to it shortly. And now back to this combat story. Let me ask you this, um, because you mentioned the low confidence and and I guess that's surprising hearing it. Um, Looking at what I know of you now, and what you've accomplished, and even just talking about playing sports, like a lot of kids don't even get to that um, stage. Where, if if at all, does the confidence level for you change? Like, wh- where does it tip from like low confidence to I can do a whole lot of things? So surrounding myself with guys that I looked up to, um, the military did that because I had guys that I, like my best friend, Curtis, we've been friends since we were seven, right? And, and then wow. another guy, Jason, but that's it. Like, I never was impressed by anybody, you know? Like, I always felt like I was uh, maybe not worthy of where you're at, but I felt like if I had the opportunity, I could do better than you, but I didn't have the confidence to, like, do that. As soon as I got in the military and saw all of these, like, because as an X-ray, like, you're a new dude, and you got guys that have got multiple deployments, ready to tell guys at selection, um, and as soon as I started beating them, you know, and like I'm, I'm dusting them on runs, on rucks, my knowledge on con ops, on planning was comparable or better. I was like, okay, I got, I got a chance here to actually be something as long as I keep my mouth shut. Um, don't be an arrogant, you know, asshole. Cause I think maybe I was putting that persona off, even though I didn't feel that way. I wanted people to think that I felt. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm saying maybe, I don't know that, that, seems to ring true to me looking back on it um but i was a sponge man i found the right people and i befriended them and they were typically all senior military you know combat veterans and they took me under the ring they helped me out man um that's the only way that i was so successful and that when i got to my group people already knew about me i'd already associated with other sf dudes and all that and helped me a lot at least speed up through the the hazing uh, new guy portion. It wasn't that long for me, to be honest. It was pretty pretty quick. Um, and we mentioned the 18 X-ray program a few times. Just people have probably heard other guests yeah. mention it, but it's effectively a direct pipeline opportunity, at least, to get into the Green Beret track, the Special Forces track. Yeah, so it's like the SEAL, um, kind of like SEALs, they can come uh, straight in and do that. Um, they did it a long time ago. Um, in the 80s, I think they did the SF baby thing. I could be wrong. But then they stopped for a long time. And then when GBOT happened, they, they kicked it up again. One of my mentors um, that I spoke about in the last podcast was at 18 x from the 80s. Um, so there's there's a lot of old timer SF guys that uh, don't like x-rays because there's been a lot of x-rays that have just they didn't earn their way through. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's that yeah. rite of passage thing that took a really long time to kind of get past and it's still there um and it will always will be but as an 18 x-ray like you have to know that these guys have done a whole lot more to get there than you have you're lucky you need to to appreciate that and understand that um and i got a taste of that so i, I think in 2014 they were letting q course guys go to free fall school right and i've waited like six seven years to go to free fall right so, <laughs> Like I get there and like half the class is Q course dudes. I'm like, you guys don't even know like how lucky you are. You've just become one of these these old yeah, crusty no, no guys. One like you, all right? Yeah. You're in the group with free fall wings, no one's gonna like you. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Yeah. Um, so let's talk the Q course and why it was so long. Could you just give people um, a snapshot of what is the Q course for those who haven't heard of it before? Yeah, yeah. So the special fall qualification course special forces qualification course is five phases um the first phase is your assessment and selection when i was going through it's 24 days they've had a few iterations it's been two weeks it's been three weeks and all that i think they're finally getting back to where they need to be um with selection but you do that um and that was an absolute um shit show so 24 days, I mean, it's amazing, but at the end, you got the trek. So the trek is like 20 something miles. You got 10 hours to do it. My feet are completely broken. Um, yeah, but either way, the, the SOC guys or the 18 Xers are typically top of the class because we train out there. Um, so yeah. we're running the routes already. 
you know, there's a couple incidents where I had some regular army guys and they're like stopping to change your socks. And I know the route is going to, and you're not supposed to talk, but it's like, Hey, if these guys don't get up right now, they're going to miss the time max. I'm like, Hey, get up, go around the corner. You were going to be down. And they're like, nah, I'm oh. like, okay. but you didn't listen to me. And yeah, they failed their time hack. Um, so it's like, you get a big advantage as, a, as an 18 extra on the selection. Uh, so each, uh, as soon as you're done with selection, you'll actually enter the qualification course as well, um, which is you're gonna learn all your MOS, your language, um, survival, escape, resist, and evade school, um, and a myriad of other stuff. So depending on your military occupational specialty, um, on an ODA, your pipeline or your Q course is longer. So an 18 Delta, um, is like a year long MOS phase, but what can really set you back is recycling stuff, right? So in language school, this is what really got me. Two things got me to the keyboards. In language school, I was, I was getting Arabic. So I was like fifth group, I got Arabic, I mean, it's great, Iraq, yeah, I'm going to see combat. And then um, they changed the DLPT, it's the Defensive Language Proficiency Test from a category three to category four, right? The jump between the three to four is huge, okay? Everyone failed. 90 Afghan language students failed. I think maybe one guy passed. So anyways, big deal, congressional hearing. Um, you got 90 dudes that you spent, you know, millions of dollars on that are not able to go forward. So they sat us in awaiting training. And they're like, hey, oh. uh, you can, so seven months, seven months. Just waiting around? Eric? Sitting and waiting. That's it. So me and some guys, we kind of formed two different parties. And eventually they were like, listen, you can go back through language school because we messed up. Or you can wait and then maybe you get pushed on Robin Sage and you're out of here and you're here. So I, me and my group were like, hey, I'm done waiting. Let's go back to language school and knock this thing out. So we get in two weeks in a language school. We find out that another group gets pushed on Robin Sage and they're going. So we call a cadre. We're like, listen, <laughs> all these dudes just when I were like, let us do that. They're like, you're already in. We've already oh. put people out. So now you got to go through language school all over again. So I did two language schools. I did French uh, for my second language. Um, knocked that thing out, which obviously changed my group, right? Yeah. All for the better. You know I mean? All the stuff in the Q course, it's like all the stuff happened. It's like, if I look back and it wouldn't have happened that way. Like, yeah, you end up somewhere else who entirely. Knows? Who knows? But um, yeah, so language school, that was, that put me way back. And then in Robin Sage. So right after we get out of language school, we go to Robin Sage. And uh, I think it was H1N1 or the swine flu or something was big. This is like end of 2008, early 2009, I want to say. So we're in Robin Sage and all of a sudden Chinooks come down. We get phone calls. They're like, you guys can't leave the woods. You have to stay out there for a week. We got an outbreak at Camp McCall. You guys are isolated. We're like, are you serious? So we ended up walking all the way back to McCall. We were isolated in our isolation bays for two weeks, cadre and everything. Oh. So that's where I met Jim Gant, James Gant, um, who was our... Uh, a field team got major at the time, pretty famous in the special operations world. Um, yeah, and then they made us recycle. So we had to recycle in the same field team, which at this field time, field team, Major Gant, yeah. he was like the worst. Because um, he so, was yeah. tough. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So he was very much so, I want to say like a tab protector, but for the 18 X rays in particular, because he was in the 80s, he was an 18 X ray. So he had like this standard that uh, you yeah. had to be able to spit off, you know, 7-8 Ranger Handbook, like, let me name a page, and you tell me what's on that page. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, which is good because I was learning all this stuff, and as I got to my first team, uh, one of my first mentors at group was just like that, and it, it helped yeah. me out a lot. But um, yeah, so we recycled that, and it's spending like three years in the Q course just waiting around oh. and stuff, and the whole time, Cadre, you're moving out, you know, going back to the groups, and they're like, dude, war's going to be over before you get there, you know, which is like the worst thing I could ever hear. That was like my driving force. Yeah. Um, and luckily, that was not an issue. <laughs> so, 
not everybody who listens to this is former military. How would you describe that? It, it, it probably sounds like a bit of a strange driving force. Like I really sure. want to get into combat. Sure. I want to go I mean, and be like, in this environment. Imagine training for something like uh, a good analogy is the football player, right? So you're training and training and training and training and training Rudy, right? From uh, the movie Rudy. Yeah. He wanted to go play, dude. He wanted to get out there and play. Like the practice team was great. He achieved that. Like how wonderful. But like that's not your training for a reason is to get out there and do that, you know? Um, and to be training for so long, that's why I feel so bad for the PJs I've always worked with. <laughs> no, no offense to the PJs. And a lot of them have gotten attacked and done a lot of great stuff. But they got that constant mindset. You know what I mean? All my buddies that are still PJs right now are like, you know, it's there. And if you talk to them, they're like, yeah, whatever. But it's like you train to do CSAR, right? You train to do recover pilots and do all that stuff. And it's happening fast, sure. You know, but it's like you want to you be able to do that regularly. And that's how I felt. That's yeah. purely I just wanted to go experience it. I didn't need to, you know, go experience death and all that but i wanted to be able to say hey, i joined and I, I did something that i can brag to my kids about man okay so so you finished the q course you go to third group what was the hazing like that you kind of alluded to earlier you said oh. it was short but it was the present so in small unit tactics which is a very stressful part of the q course that's where you learn you're like it's like ranger school minus you know but there was an instructor there his name was sergeant first class rose he was the biggest asshole ever. And he might be listening to this. He would be the biggest asshole ever. I mean, he would purely just go out and break guys off just to break them off, right? So I did not like him. I avoided him at all costs. You could not have a pleasurable conversation with him. So I, my wife at the time, um, Italy girl, um, uh, was uh, doing hair. A coworker of hers, husband was a team sergeant at third group. I ran into him, Mike Ray, who ended up being on Roughneck 391, DeBecca uh, Pass. Mm. You know, I think you got a guy recently yeah. to talk about that. Um, and uh, so that was my in. Like, I had my team sergeant. He's going to pull me the team, which he did, um, and all that. So that was kind of my in. But the first day I show up at group, I go into group headquarters, and a guy from my ODA, uh, Bobby Farmer, or from my company, Bobby Farmer said, hey, Chief, this is your new guy. And I turn around and it's Sergeant First Class Rose went to love it. warrant officer school, right? And so I turn around, I'm like, oh, fuck. Sorry for my profanity. Yeah. Okay. And he looks at me, he's like, the hell you are on my team. And just turns around, like blocks off. I'm like, <laughs> dude. I'm like, I got this guy. Um, anyways, he ended up being obviously a solid individual, um, really great guy. The personality never left. He was always kind of like, you try and take his photo overseas and he'll like give you the finger at that guy. Um, but super cool dude. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we were prepping for deployment. Like uh, a few months later, we had the NTC trip with the uh, Dubai UAE soft guys and then we're, we're going. So we were fielding the SCARs, the FN SCARs, right? We're in the trial period. So that was my first day at group. We went out to the range and tested the uh, FN SCARs out there. And the guys were very focused on deploying and they didn't they didn't mess with me much. You know, it was just Chief Rose yeah. kind of gave me some stuff there at the beginning, but it was all hot and heavy. We got a deployment and uh, let's get ready to go. Damn, you've got several stories of people who are tough on you early, but it helps you out later. You know, yeah. which I think is a it, it's a reality. Yep. But we kind of shy away from it today, I think. Yeah. To our detriment. For sure. Damn. Um, but yeah, yeah. So we do that first deployment, and then that kind of leads into that first combat mission there. Um, matter of fact, so I had a few times outside the wire before that combat mission. Uh, the week. The week I got there, so we had that Kabul incident um, where our battalion had to go in there and wax some guys in Kabul. A week later, um, J.P. Thompson, a team leader for 334, um, got killed green on blue by his interpreter at Syedabad, which I would, didn't know at the time, but I'd spent a whole lot of deployments at this exact location. Oh. Um, and to be honest, Syedabad is like, the 18 Alpha, 18 Zulu graveyard. Um, 
Person. People people won't know an, an alpha oh, and Zulu. Can you just speak to that yeah, real yeah. quick? So, so on an on an ODA, we'll just go through the MOS. And so you're supposed to have 12 guys on an ODA. Your leadership is your alpha, which is your captain. He's your team leader. Um, the next one down from that, technically, is your warrant, your 180 alpha. We call them whiskey is a call sign. Um, and then you have your Zulu, 18 Zulu, which is your team start, your senior, senior enlisted um advisor on the team that handles your day-to-day -day operations then you got your bravo weapons guys charlie's uh uh engineer demo mm -hmm. um uh, delta is your medics and echoes your comm guys and there's two of each of those mos's because as an oda you need to have the capability to do split team operations so six guys over here six guys over here you get the same capabilities on each other um so for some reason um, in 2010, we had, uh, the alpha on three, four, get killed. The next trip was my team alpha killed the next trip after that, uh, Zulu killed the next trip after that Zulu killed Jeez. and then the next trip after that an alpha and Zulu got killed and the next valley is over. So, but it's not like, yeah. So it was like weird. It's not that they know that these guys are who these guys are. Maybe we just had some hard charging team leaders and Zulus, I don't know. Um, but it was just really weird. After like four deployments, we're like, something's weird here. Well, <laughs> yeah. And, and you lost your team leader when you were there? Yeah, sure. so my second trip, on the first trip, we, we did a bunch of stuff, obviously did that combat mission. We had some Navy guys um, trying to party is the word on the street. They tried to leave from one base to the other, got lost. Ended up driving towards Tangy Valley somehow. Um, got stopped by Taliban checkpoint. Um, the driver, I believe, got killed trying to run through the checkpoint. And then the other guy got kidnapped. Um, so that was at the very end of the first two Afghan National Army Special Forces classes. So we had two operational ODAs, uh, ANA ODAs at Camp Morehead. So the first two missions that Afghan National Army Special Forces did was to rescue two American Navy. No way. Yep. And no so way. we went out there to Baraki Barak, which funny again, I spent a lot of time that in BBK, Baraki Barak, which is the village. So Tangy Valley feeds into BBK. And we'll get into Extortion 17. That's where yep. uh, Extortion got shot down. Um, so... Yeah, that was the first trip there. We had um, CAG and Team 6, I believe, or Task Force Incorporated, yeah. both of them, hit the same objective at the same time. So we had a blocking position on the far end of the valley. We kind of knew where the bodies were. Um, so obviously, Green and Blue went in there, and their endage. I mean, there's like gunfire. We're like, oh, shit. Like, they found, like, the hot objective, you know? And then our interpreters are monitoring traffic with their interpreters. I don't know how that worked out, but <laughs> so we can hear them shooting at each other. Like one interpreter is like, oh, enemy is over here. And then we can hear the other. No. Then we're like, dude, they're shooting each other and they don't know it. You know, so we ended up calling on 102, which is our overarching SOTA Special Operating Task Force East Satellite Channel and said, hey, relay to them like they're. And mind you, the only time anything like that is ever going to happen is if you got a captured American, yeah. you know, because there's no coordination, you don't communicate, you got different crypto, you got different stuff. So I think on uh, the trails uh, mission, there was some crypto and communication issues as well. Um, but yeah, so that happened. Um, <laughs> on that one, Eric, can I just ask, cause yeah. certainly like when I got to the agency, I was around more, you know, of the tier one and two folks, but in the conventional army, it's rare. So like when we were working with third group, we were like, whoa, yeah. this is like the pinnacle. We would never see Delta guys. Like occasionally something would come along and we'd help well, we, out. We, we don't that much either. That, that's why I wanted to ask was, especially early on in your time, like you've kind of grown up, you, as you said, you've watched Black Hawk Down a million times, you know of this and you probably get closer and closer to it as you get into the SF realm, but then you're like doing a blocking position and you know, these units are going in. Is it, is it kind of like surreal that this is going on? Um, yes and no at the same time. Um, cause we had a, a 
we had a mission to do and we're testing these guys out. Like they were not supposed to be operational. Yeah. Um, we like grabbed guns from the Kandak and the ammo and all that. So this is very like hot box. So I was really focused on my assault. <laughs> stuff, like making sure that they, one, we hadn't really vetted them either. You know what I mean? So like we did the biometrics, but biometrics isn't going to tell you much. Right. So it's like, are these guys going to turn on us? Like, you know, so it was a little bit as a new guy, like they're like, hey, watch everybody, make sure nothing happens. So that was kind of my, my main focus. But we had been building rapport with these guys for a long time. So I really trusted them. Later on, we found out that there were some people that had gotten in um, that did some really bad stuff. But yeah. um, no, eventually what had happened was uh, CAG and, and Task Force Ranger and all of them were um, like the bad guys. So when we're doing VSO, like they're doing hits in our AOR and they're killing our sources that are telling us where the IEDs are. We'll get to that on the next deployment where I have to start going out on their operations. They want to hit any target in our valley. One of us had to go with them. Okay. If I, who our guys are, um, because one dude that was, he was our main guy telling us where all the IEDs were. And we had lost three green berets, um, previously to an ID on my team and they killed him. No. And we're like, this is our dude. You know what I mean? So it was a really big deal. Um, it's a huge setback. I mean, not just like the loss of of somebody who's like been supporting you, but it probably sets you back operationally significantly. Well, what ended up happening was a lot of our sources were a lot bigger than we had thought they were. Um, and so we ended up having to hand them off. Yeah. yeah. So it's like they're giving us a very relevant tactical information to affect our immediate space but they also have strategic level stuff yeah we handed those off to you guys and then i know them. we're notorious for that the agency yeah, so is pretty bad like, about crap. it okay now we may not be able to go in this area yeah get blown up. um but anyways <laughs> we'll get there did they recover the the navy guy they were recovered um okay. Yeah, matter of fact, you can probably find a news story. Yeah, I'll find that. Um, something. But yeah, that was the first NASF mission. Um, did a lot of really cool stuff. It was great. Um, yeah, to at least see the backside support was standing up a unit. Obviously, we had, you know, one star Miller at the time. Um, now he's, I think he's a four star. Mm -hmm. uh, now he's a civilian. Uh, so yeah, it was just really cool, man. Um, and then we flooded these ODAs out to all the American ODAs throughout the country, and they were a roaring success. Um, I would say 90% of the teams were knocking SF dudes out of the stack to get in the rooms. They were really wow, solid. really solid, really solid. Jeez. So you must have come back from this first deployment pretty, I don't know, optimistic maybe? Like, hey, this was a good, this is what I signed up for? Yeah, but I mean, we definitely wanted the the next thing. We we kind of heard down the pipe that the strategy was going to turn to a more SF mission, um, which led into village stability operations, um, which could have worked. I just didn't know if America had the guts to do it. You know, super long deployments, lots of time there. Um, it'd be and it's a, it's an austere environment where you can't really keep those lines of communication that we like to um, keep between our, our partners. So it would have been a tough it would have been a tough ask. Um, but uh, yeah, um, build stability operations leads into deployment two. Yeah, let's hear this, man. How much time did you have between one and two? Uh, like nothing, man. So I did four deployments between 2010 and December, 2014. So January 1st, 2010 to December, 2014, I did four deployments. My God. Um, and, and that's the thing. It's like a lot of guys are like, yeah, 13 deployments, nine deployments. Like, okay. Like I get it. You know, a lot of those are three monthers, right? And SF, like if I were to call them three month deployments, I'd have eight, right? Um, and and I get it, the op tempo. And at the time, you know, through village stability operations deployment two, which we're about to talk about, um, that three month thing in the the op tempo, we weren't. I'm, I'm sure they had you know an idea of how much uh, effects this was having on the psyche of operators um, throughout. But like nine months to ten months, my first two, two deployments were a ten month or an eight month or um, the 2011 one was super kinetic 
And doing that for 10 months had a long lasting effect on me that I'm still dealing with today. Um, so when we first got in, so I had in between the, in between the first trip and the second trip, I had done a little drinking. Um, and, uh, and on this one incident, um, I was at a party and I had it been drinking. It was like my half beer ended up getting sucker punched. Hadn't even talked to the guy. Okay. So let's not get the comment section wild here. Um, and, um, yeah, so I broke my jaw and this was like three months before my next deployment. So they were like, you're not deploying. I was like, yeah, right. I will get there. You can't stop me. They finally said, okay, you're going to do uh, administrative support team AST duty at SODIF, um, SODIF East, Special Operations Task Force East, um, which is a desk job. It sucks, but someone's got to do it. Typically, it's guys that get in trouble or guys that are injured or, or something like that, or new guys, brand new guys. Um, so I do that. The full, full First part of the trip, I'd say like my first, well, I don't know exactly when we got there, but um, March and April, at least those two months, I was listening to my team get in gunfights almost every day. <laughs> and they'd call me after like, hey, did you hear us today? I'm like, yeah, you know I heard you, okay? You know I heard you. Um, and especially when I'm on, because they like knew my shift, right? So like if I'm on the comms, like they'll do something just to mess with me. Um, particularly Marty, Marty upon our senior Bravo at the time, just, he lived like a mile away from me. We were super tight. So anyways, um, they're just super kinetic, all kinds of ODAs are getting it all over the country. And then May 29th, um, at the time as AST, I think our battle NCIC that actually does the battle tracking comms was getting lunch or something. So I was filling in for him. And um, a call comes over. I hear it's Chris K. Hall, my team sergeant. And uh, he says, catastrophic kill, catastrophic kill, IED, IED. Um, the whole option uh, goes silent, lights turn on. And let me kind of back up to, to kind of set the context yeah. of this. So most missions during VSO is to establish white space. White space is area that's permissible that you can operate within and not have a big fear of getting attacked. Village stability operations strategy is to embed special forces teams strategically out in the countryside to affect populations, to recruit guerrilla forces, um, to combat the Taliban terrorists. So, we're trying to find people that are sympathetic to our cause, uh, operate by, with, and through, train and advise them, and assist them to fight their own battle. Um, that was the, that's probably the most professional way <laughs> that I That's can, textbook right there, you know, man. <laughs> relay the strategy there. But the concept was we didn't have anyone that's going to help us fight, right? So how do we recruit people to do it? We need to go out in their villages and live with them and almost kind of force them to be friends with us type thing. That's what BSO was. Um, so in order to achieve that, you identify some areas that you don't think a lot of fighters are in because typically the villages that are not supportive of the Taliban don't allow them to operate in there. So there's not a lot of significant activities, troops and contact calls, all that within these areas. So they will put an ODA into an area of the software that we track all the significant activities don't show a lot of activity, right? Um, we can only go so, so far with our human that we collected from the 80s, you know, with Mujahideen and the Russia thing. Um, that helped us out a lot in the beginning, but as we started expanding, getting more forces in there, we were really limited. So that was another mission, obviously collecting um, people to talk to, to give us information, to put it lightly. Um, so, that really set off the entire, um, that got the Taliban worried, really worried. Um, so they knew that these ODAs were isolated. Um, they could affect them um, tactically and strategically over a long-term campaign against these bill stability platforms, right? Make sure that they can't recruit anybody. If they know that they can't recruit anybody, then their mission's gonna fail. Um, we ended up did. Uh, we did recruit a few, um, and it was semi-successful, but it got crazy. Um, so 
May 29th, um, they're doing a movement to contact my team. I'm on comms, tracking them, and we get word uh, through signal intelligence that an Afghan national police officer was kidnapped about two kilometers away from their route where they were. It's a movement of contact, so there's no real objective, you know, there. It's like, hey, go here, see what happens um, type thing. So, hey, we got a hostage rescue mission here. Um, let's get some birds overhead and see where we can see if it's happening. So uh, FMV gets overhead and sees a huge conglomeration at an Afghan National Police Station. We're like, hey, this is where they got them. They're holding the people. People are going crazy. It's like a little riot going on out there. So we ended up telling my ODA, hey, Frago, you're going to go to this grid, get eyes on or affect that, break this up or, or something, or wait for an HR element to, to come in and, and help this guy out. I don't know if an A&P guy would be worth <laughs> right. setting an HR element in. So we were like, maybe we will do some HR here. Um, in route, unfortunately, they hit a, uh, I think it's a T-72 Italian anti-tank mine um, that was on top of, well, it flipped the truck a couple of times. So we'll say 100 pounds to 200 pounds of uh, homemade explosives. Truck one was our minigun truck with uh, Joe Schultz, our team leader, my junior at the time, Gene Braxton, um, Aaron Blagio, our dog handler, as a dog handler, his dog, our level one American citizen interpreter. Um, they all died. Um, so truck flipped over a few times. My junior actually got ejected out of the driver's seat 20, 30 feet into some grass. Um, and yeah, on the radio call, catastrophic kills and near ambush. Um, they had seen that we were trying to establish white space for a long time and decided to hit us with something big. Um, so that was obviously super hectic. Um, I'm on the radio the whole time, um, hearing my team go through this. And then uh, probably five minutes later, being on the radio, it's like, you don't know what's going on. Like, hey, come back up on comms, what's happening? And then we find out that no one can find Marty. Marty was their senior Bravo um, that I was telling you about that would call me <laughs> and tell me that stuff uh, on the minigun and what happened when the truck uh, hit the ID. It had flipped completely over on top of itself and he was in there the whole time. They figured he'd been ejected. However, the call went up that we got a missing American on objective and it was a straight up, you know, operation Red Wing all over again. Um, everybody shut down. Um, a long sustained gunfight. We had a few ODAs at Moorhead um, that were ready to roll, but they were training out in the field at the time. So they're going to be like 40 minutes out. We had the Pathfinder, I think 101 Pathfinder unit at Task Force or at Logar. I'm a uh, shank, Fob Shank in Logar. Came in like 25 minutes, secured the area, um, got all over. They found Marty um, in the truck. And um, yeah, so. At that time, obviously, this was the largest Green Beret casualty event, um, I believe, in all of GWAT. Um, so they said, no more gun trucks. You're going to have to use your MRAPs. At that point, they were like, ODA 3333, you're getting disbanded. Um, we don't know what you're going to do with you. And we flipped out. Um, Petraeus came in, you know, the Memorial, they do a bargain for anyone that dies. Um, it's really special. They do something big. Petraeus was there and he came up and shook, you know, each one of her hands. If there's anything I can do for you, son, let me know. And I grabbed his hand and I pulled him back as he's walking. I pulled him back and I said, hey, sir, how about giving drop authority to the ground force commander on the ground? And he said, son, I can't do that for you. And kept walking on. I was like, You're good on you for asking, man. Yeah, That's honestly, it's like, don't tell me that if there's anything I can do for you. Yeah. Like, okay, <laughs> I'll let you know right now. Dude, I got to ask you, man, you're on the radios, and these these are guys you deployed with before. Yeah, these are my dudes. You know all of these guys. Yeah. Yep. How knew. hard was that? So it's like, I've, I've been hearing their tips, their troops and contact chatter for months, two months. And they've been in like probably 20 gunfights before this. As soon as I heard, heard Chris come over, kind of started to kill, I could hear it. I could hear it in his voice. Everybody, the voice. Everybody could. You know, everyone was like, oh, shit, what the hell is happening? You got that big blinking red light tick, like, what's going on? Everyone stopped. Um, it, was, it was intense, to say the least. Um, 
And I know there's some there's some guys that in early in the war like they'll they'll want to sound, you know, intense on the radio so they can get AWT over and all that. This was not that. This was no shit. Like we're in trouble. Real. Um, type stuff. So, um, that was super hard to deal with. Um, the next two weeks during the morning period, we built target package after target package because they said, "Hey, we're going to allow you guys to stay out there. We'll give you some 19th Troop guys as our National Guard um, yep. guys. We'll give you some soccer medics um, and all that." And we were plus up. We had Navy EOD. We we had an infantry uplift unit from 10th Mountain, I believe, um, and all that, but. This was game on at this point. Um, we had all had a deployment under a belt or two. And um, yeah, so first mission, we're like, hey, we're going right back to where we got blown up. We're going to go ahead and flood the entire valley. Everything's going to be good. We're going to show them like, this is our space and you can't do this to us. And they, they sent us another message. So the very first mission that I went on on this was the first mission after the ID. We're going out to Musa Calais village. Um, and so I'm in a big ass RG 33, 52,000 pound up armored vehicle. Um, we got tons of infantry there. Goldie, Goldie is like, you can detect uh, uh, command wires for IDs and all that. They're scanning it. Well, our source that um, task forces are about to kill here in a couple months is telling us, uh, where are the ideas? He's like, dude, there's an IED right here. We met with him the day prior. We showed him imagery. He's like, right here. I'm like, done. Give me my money. Okay, here's your money. Da da. And so we stop. I'm buttoned up. I'm like 50 feet from the IED that we know it's there. Okay, let's get everyone out of the vehicle. So we had a, a human terrain technician, an agency chick with us. It was incredible. We're still friends to this day. She ended up getting like the kills on this deployment. Um, and uh, I think a, a Navy 35 series Intel guy and like an interpreter and me. Like everyone else got out of the vehicle. So we're like, okay, great. <laughs> but it's going to happen. I'm glad I'm the, the sacrificial lamb here. So they end up sweeping that whole area and they're like, we're good. You know, come on up. Come on. I'm like, all right, well, here we go. So I'm driving up. And then as soon as I get on the peak of the cell, boom. Blows off the front end of the RG33. I'm tied in. I can see my dip bottles and, and trash fly up. And as I come down, I'm strapped in tight, right? But my head is still movable. So as I come down, my head comes over. And in RG33, they're not the most, they, they don't offer you a lot of space. We'll just yeah. say that. So I hit my head on the steering wheel, ended up getting knocked unconscious for a few seconds, 10 or 15 seconds. And then I wake up and I can hear like fire from our support by fire position, our razors up above us. And I'm like, oh my God, we're getting near ambushed again. And so I'm trying to open the door and I'm like, combat locks on the lost all hydraulics. So oh. the back door can't open. So now I'm like, okay, well, someone's gonna have to get out. Um, I guess it's gonna be me. I'm not gonna ask the intel. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm like, all right, here I go. I'm just waiting for PKM or RPGs. Typically, if you got a, a stationary up armored vehicle, RPGs are going to just go right through it. So that's what I'm thinking. Anyways, it was a low order. Thank God. Um, there was a whole bunch of HME helmet explosives underneath the charge that didn't blow up. Um, or else we would have been a roll to her. Um, but yeah, the rest of that trip, man, we had Navy of D guys both got shot in the head. Um, we ended up doing probably 180 con ops. Um, Get out. One, well, so each time you do split team ops, so we're split teams, and each time you go out to transfer over, that's a con op. So I guess you could say like real actual con ops, probably 70 to 80, and over you know 60 of those were gunfights. You know, multiple that's no fights. joke. Um, well, let me ask you this, Eric. So like when you, when you're looking at that many, and now I, I see what you meant earlier when you said like this thing was kinetic and, and still stays with you. Is there one of those moments where, where you were like, Hey, this thing could go sideways going into it. You, you kind of knew something bad could happen as a result. Um, not so much on, not so much on that deployment. There was the first time I ever felt dread, um, was on that deployment. But there was no, so we, we needed to use the, uh, the Humvees again, the gun trucks again. One of our up armored MRAPs were down for maintenance or something. So we had to go pick up the other team. 
they were like, Neil, you're going to run minigun on the gun truck. And I had an issue with that. Um, and I was like, why? Why don't we just, because at the time we needed to allow more room for the guys to get in the trucks to come, come back. I was like, why don't we just use some razors or some ATVs or something like that? Like, I don't want to be stuck in, in this fucking thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyways, you know, it didn't work out that way, but I ended up going on it and I just felt like I was going to die. Um, I don't have a good reason for it. Um, besides needing to get back in the truck that I know if this gets hit by an idea, everyone's done. You know, there's no V hole here. Yeah. Um, the only other time was my fourth deployment, my fourth deployment, um, which we'll get to, um, on that notion, but on that one, we had our JSOC Intel analysts. This is up at Kundus. Kundus have been overrun um, by some guys and their Intel said there's probably, you know, 50 to 60 fighters in this one village. Our company, Sergeant Major at the time was a, a unit guy, um, previously and was like, came to us before and was like, listen, the unit has hit this like six times in the last three years. Cause the unit was done in Afghanistan. So all their target packages came to us. Um, so then I was like, okay, this is, this is the real deal. Um, and I need to prep my team for this. Cause I knew that a lot of them were really young and they had never been a part of something like this. Um, but I think we, maybe we could save that to the end. Cause that's the okay. last yeah. real big mission I was on. Um, so yeah, 2011, um, is, is cracking off. Everything's going good. And then June, early June, I think it is, we're coming back from a, a split team op and midnight. I think we got woken up or we're coming in at like one or two in the morning. We hear that a, a JSOC bird had gotten shot down in Tangy Valley, which is like, if you look at where we were, I can see the mountains from our cop that straddle the Tangy Valley. So it's like right there. Um, and that was extortion 17. So extortion 17 gets shot down, uh, in June, 2011, our ODA is the closest special operations force to that. And I remember us getting a call on Iridium, um, from Siege of Soda, Camp Alpha, um, all that telling us to get ready. Can we go support this? And it was like six of us. We, we don't even have like nothing, mm -hmm. no food, no nothing. And uh, we had, we didn't know what was going on. We said, unfortunately, there's six of us. There's a Chinook now. I'm like, I'm sure you got some Rangers somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Come in and, and get that or Pathfinder or something. And we didn't know the extent of it. And we knew Tangy Valley was bad because um, helicopters have been shot down there in the past. Like I was just telling you, um, our senior Bravo, his wife, Talia Ramirez was a Kiowa pilot um, and got shot down on deployment when we were there. Um, and uh, yeah, just super tragic in, the, in that specific area. So anyways, the source in 17 thing happens. Uh, we're getting ready to go out there just because we're not sure what the hell is going on. It's like, yeah, there's six of us. We can't go. But if they tell us to go, like we're still going. We're going. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, an hour later, they're like, hey, we got a ground convoy bringing the bodies back. Uh, so we secured that corridor for them to come in. And then we just watched the uh, the Humvees come in with all the body bags. Um, we started bringing in CH-47s from Bagram into Camp uh, Cops Ayanabad. And I carried probably about 12 of them. Um, saw their guns completely melted. So we knew it was a catastrophic fire um, that had happened. Um, at the time I had felt some bodies that, um, were very light. Um, so I figured it was, they got hit from a very high altitude to, uh, cause bodies to come apart. Um, uh, but I think I carried the dog. I didn't know that there was a dog on the objective. So when I found out about that, I was like, that must've been the light body bag that I had. And it's um, just, it's in a bag basically. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, oh. and, I mean, to be honest, so the way that it worked out to getting getting all of them on the helicopters, one thing that really stays with me is how tired I was. They're heavy dudes, you know, 180 to 225 athletic specimens. Um, they were very heavy. Um, and I carried a, a couple of bodies before that, but 12 of them consecutively. I remember sitting on the Chinook as we were putting the uh, flags over them to head them off to Bagram just smoked, tired, and exhausted from carrying their bodies. 
And um, I'm getting just a little bit uh, caught up from that moment right now, but knowing the magnitude of it and understanding who these guys are and understanding the impact it's about to have on America, they're about to find out here probably 10, 12 hours that something like this happened. Um, it was extremely powerful, um, extremely heavy. And we knew like, hey, we're going to Tangy after this. Like, we know, it. like there's going to be yeah. some revenge ops or something. So like, hey, let's let's get all our stuff together. Let's do a resupply mission from Bagram. Make sure we got everything we need to start making sure these guys pay. So, and, and you knew this was, you, you knew it was a, obviously a JSOC bird. Oh. It's carrying operators. Well, anyone, um, anyone flying around that we don't know is flying around, like we know it's them. Right, yeah. so we'll we'll be able to see our blue force tractor, um, all the other birds flying around. But then we'll get word, typically like an hour or two ahead of time that they're coming in doing off or AOR, yeah. or they're or they're doing something else. Um, but as soon as I mean, they'll tell you, you know, a call sign of the bird, we know, yeah, what it is. I think they were they on National Guard birds at the time, or were they on MHs? I don't I thought it was an there. MH man. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I would imagine they're on MHs, but I know at the time. So like Soar, Soar is great. I love the guys. Um, I still got tons of friends with them, but they would not fly for us. If they didn't have three miles of visibility and there wasn't Spectre gunship or whatever on stage. Really? Nah. Nah, you were good. So dude, we were rolling with National Guard birds like 90% of the time. We had they'll do CW4. anything. We had a CW4 dust off pilot from Vietnam. That was an Alabama National Guard Chinook pilot now. And we yeah. had him on the phone. We're like, hey, we got a mission going up. 60th isn't going to do anything for us. You got us. And he was like, hey, oh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and we yeah. had a W-5 in our unit when I was there in 08. National Guard guy, flew in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The dude never wanted anything electronic. He wanted like a yeah. regular map. <laughs> and he's like, just draw me What's what that? the LZ looks like. He was. He's got, he's got a compass and a protractor. Yeah, he was like, "Don't give me this stuff, man." Oh, that's great, yeah, dude! I can't even imagine what the feeling was like carrying those bags. I, I cannot. Is. So you know, like you do drills, like with Rescue Randy. We'll go on Rescue Randy. It's the two hundred pound dummies that yeah, you know, do all your battle drills with and all that. But dead weight, um, and, and all that. And I hate to say it that way, but you know what I mean. No, yeah, yeah. Um, was big and it was a huge impact on me. And it really allowed me to think, let alone obviously losing my guys um, to the IED was that first moment where you're like, you realize you're not immortal. Yeah. You know what I mean? You go through all this training and you're like, man, I'm a fucking, I'm badass, dude. Like I'm great. And then your guys die that you looked up to and you're like, okay, well, this is for real. Yeah. Um, it's that first real, like, this is for keeps. You're playing for keeps here. This is, you don't get to recock on this one. And then um, the extortion thing was the second big thing. It was like, these are America's best here. And all it takes is that one guy with the RPG and you're right there and this is what happens. Um, so everything got a little bit more real for me. I got, I guess I got a little bit more strategic with my thinking and, and the risks that I was taking. Um, not on this deployment, because this deployment was wild, but the other ones after that, I guess my mortality was more present within my vision. Um, that didn't ever stop me from doing what I needed to do. Thank God. Um, if I would have had kids, like all my buddies that have kids, I'm like, how do you do it, man? I don't know. It changes things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so extortion happened, super tragic. Um, and on that trip, we had worked with SEAL Team, I think 10, because the SEAL Teams tried to do the UW thing as well on that trip. And they had never done it before. So we kind of mentored them on how to do those stability operations. Uh, so we were kind of tight with with all the seals and and, and task force there. So that was a super tough one. And then a, like two weeks later, um, a humongous V bid, the largest V bid I think in all of GWAT, um, happened at our compound um, on the anniversary of 9/11 in 2011. We had 74 wounded in action on a Jeez. combat outpost that only had 200 tops. Right. So it was a, a, an immediate 50% reduction in force. <laughs> yeah. So the bandwidth was great on the internet for a good time. <laughs> um, but yeah, no injuries. There was four, uh, four Afghans killed 
And the way that that happened was um, super intense. So we had just gotten back from the split team. We're in our uh, team room. I think we were watching. <laughs> so funny story. On the way out to our uh, field stability platform in our cot, one of our, our trailers with all of our MWR, our morale and welfare stuff, had gotten damaged, blown up, or whatever. And all we had was Tropic Thunder and the first season of Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> and we watched the hell out of it, man. Downton Abbey, I don't care what anybody says, I'm, I'm a big fan, okay? Downton Abbey will get you emotionally and everything. So I think we were watching uh, under Downton Abbey or something, and all of a sudden, boom, the TV flies off the wall, all of our food and everything comes off, and we're looking at each other, and we think a 107 round, because they have really good uh, rocket launcher guys, whatever, marksmen, recoilless rifle operators, all that. I mean, there was a recoilless rifle operator that was hitting us shoulder fire, shoulder fire, spig nine, from 3K out and landing in our compound. What? Yes, a spig. I mean, the thing is like five times the size on a shoulder and on our flare, we can see him get up over it and shoulder fires this thing. <laughs> and he's getting him into our compound, dude. So this guy deserves a Guinness Book of World Records award. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, so we obviously bounce out of our little team room real quick to see what's happening. And I look up over the roof and there's a 500 foot plume of smoke and so we know yeah. right, we didn't get rocketed we just got hit with a v-bid um right outside of our wire um so at that time we're in a hit there was a bunch of support people like the cooks all that the infantry was kind of down below under us and where they had hit like the main entrance area we knew that there was no meat eaters over there at all so we ended up grabbing our kit and we were sprinting down the hill. And luckily, um, it was just the V-Bid guy. It wasn't a complex ambush or anything. But um, the force of this explosion. So it was a jingle truck. Are you familiar? For oh, yeah. those that don't know, uh, jingle truck is a full steel, uh, you, it's kind of like a, a garbage truck. If you ever see a garbage truck or something, that probably be the best comparison to it. Um, and it was packed to the max. Um, so probably close to 10 to 20,000 pounds of explosives. The crater was 10 to 12 feet deep by 20 something feet wide. I've got a photo of it that I'll send you. Our Navy EOD a guy is standing in it. And the overpressure from this V bed. So, you know, like a ceiling container, a big old 40 foot cargo container blown into cylinders. The overpressure blew these things out into cylinders. Um, yeah, I think an Afghan kid was riding his bike and died, and then our two gate guards died, and then someone at the uh, government center counting forward to our combat outpost. So all in all, it could have been way worse. However, they completely made the most effective combat outpost that's messing with all their cellular networks um, throughout the area, their terrorist networks. Completely combat in effect. So they almost got rid of the whole cop. So they were like, hey, let's just get everyone out of here. We ended up convincing them not to do that. And then they brought in a whole nother battalion of infantry kids from, uh, I'm not exactly sure, I don't remember, but uh, Old Ironside Cav Scouts? Is Old Ironside Cav Scouts? Um, either way, a different infantry, infantry unit. Um, yeah, that's all one trip, dude. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's trip two. Um, How are you thinking about trip two when you come back home? So when I came back home, I really felt like I uh, had earned my stripes, I guess you could say, and I've done it. I felt fulfilled, more than fulfilled. I got way more than I wanted to. Um, I want to say I got way more than I wanted to. I'd say I got way more than I had thought I would. Considering yeah. the first appointment, I, like, I went on a lot of direct action stuff, but Build stability operations, you're living out there. Like, you don't get to come home and take a shower, refit, and eat, and work out, and then go get on a helicopter and do another night raid. Like, you live out there. So, it's every morning you're waking up, um, walking out, getting to know your villagers, getting food from them. You're trying to build rapport at the same time because you're got a mission here. We're trying to recruit people to fight with you. Yeah. The only way that that can happen is these people in these villages got to know that you're down. 
Yeah. They got to know that you're willing to put your life on the line and go out there and take it to the enemy. Because if you can't do that, then you're never going to find anyone that wants to fight with you. You know, it's never going to happen. How much, if at all, did you change after that? Like you, you're still in your twenties at this time, right? Like how old are you at that time? Yeah. Yeah. I was probably 25. That's crazy. Like, did you feel a noticeable change in who you were when you came back? Um, yeah, after that one, I did. Well, I don't think at the time I did because I was so caught up with, you know, the mission at hand. I think yeah. a couple of years later, as I'm looking in retrospect at who I was, the decisions I made and all that, I definitely changed as a person. Was it for the better? I don't know. I think between my second deployment and my fourth deployment, I really uh, grew as a human being and an individual to understand what war is, you know? War is a business. When you're a professional warrior, you can't get so emotional about it. You can't get so tied up about it. Uh, you just gotta go out there and work. And I think between two and four deployments, I really matured as, um, you know, I, I don't like using the term operator, but just for the sake of argument, um, yeah. operating, why I was doing it changed drastically, right? So initially, why you're going to Afghanistan is to save America. Right. You're there to, you know, to affect and make sure that they can't have the capabilities to, you know, affect operations here on the homeland. All that. Got it. Cool. Right. Eventually, once you go over there back and forth and back and forth, it starts to not become so much about that. It starts to become more about getting revenge for your buddies. Um, because if, if I'm going to be frank and I'm going to be completely clear, the Taliban are not planning any attacks outside of Afghanistan, right? They never have, never will. The majority of people that we're fighting are just like me and you. They really are. If you could separate, let's say you have another country like China or whoever that wants to come into America and change us from a democracy to anything else, just name it. We're going to be putting IEDs in the road. We're going to be doing all this stuff, right? So it started to change from a personal thing with these guys to a... Now I'm just getting rid of you because it's a, this is a business deal, right? And we both voluntarily signed on this, on this yeah. right here, right? <laughs> and you're in your mid twenties coming to this real, oh man. All right. So yeah. round, round three, where do you go? Yeah. So uh, after my second trip, um, I started drinking a lot, um, just trying to feel that excitement again, kind of lost my way. I got a DUI in april 2012 um i told my command about it because i'm super just awesome <laughs> and um yeah so they sent me to hsc which is our headquarters support company so each sf battalion has a company where all our direct support our human guys are there all of our intel seaburn um name it all logistics our, yeah all of our direct support is there um, and so I took that, um, over to help train those guys up as my punishment and ended up being one of the coolest experiences ever. As an 18 extra, I never had Joe's, you know, Joe's a, yeah. an enduring term for a subordinate. Um, I never had that. And so finally, like I got guys that I could mentor and like actually teach stuff to. And it's like, even though I got the DUI, like my chain of command knew like, Hey, you're a freaking good dude. And I think even my sergeant major, well, I won't say, I won't say who it was, but they were like, hey, you just got caught, bud. Like, we've all done it. You know, unfortunately, yeah. you're going to have to go through this thing. I was like, okay. But it was such a good experience. So my third deployment, I deployed with the SOTIF um, and ran our forward. It's a long, it's a long one. Forward logistical element, tactical assault convoy. It's the fleet tech, right? So the nice. fleet stack is the resupply element for all of SOF under siege of So if any ODAs or SEAL teams or anybody that's attached to siege of needs resupply, we're the ones that come and do that. So massive convoys, we bring all the crypto, all that stuff. And then obviously we're running the worst roads ever. So we get hit a lot. Um, but you're out there on those ops. Yeah, right. yeah, you're like yeah. okay. Yeah, so uh, me and a couple other guys, uh, a couple other SF guys at the HSC would be in charge of running all those operations for 16 um, teams throughout our cities. Um, 
So we knocked that out. And then um, it was just a really good experience because I was also in charge of all base defense operations for Montrum, Camp Montrum. So, and for all you guys, uh, for everyone that doesn't know, there's only so many ways to get into Bagram. Montrond is one of them. So for all tier one, tier two assets that need to get on and off base for um, mission related activities, <laughs> I guess you could say, you go through Montrond. So I was like the gatekeeper for all that stuff. So you can see there's a benefit there. Yeah. Um, and so it was a really cool uh, mission just to see the backside stuff on how everything's battle track, how you're actually um, doing the battalion level, soda level type operations. So really cool. Um, and we lost that, that trip is super kinetic. We lost a lot of green berets that trip that were super good buddies of mine. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, all in all in between deployments after that one, it's just schools, connect schools is trying to get yeah. as effective and as lethal as possible, increase your survivability. And then, um, the fourth deployment at this time, I've been Boris. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm a first one with a new team. So after, typically after HSC, you can go back to your company. Um, but I've been trying to get on a free fall team. So they changed me from, uh, Seco to ACO cause they had a, a slot for me in ACO. So I moved companies, went to their free fall team, did a bunch of schools between my third and fourth trip. And then, uh, the fourth trip was another really big one. I lost another teammate. Jeez, man. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, it was awesome. So it, it's almost the, the way you say it is so matter of fact, like, and you mentioned, you know, like a lot of these things are still with you today. Yeah. Do you just, have, have you almost become numb to losing this many people? Um, so there's a huge difference between my second team, and my first team. I wasn't getting as close to my intentionally. Second. Intentionally. Um, so there's a, there's a saying like nothing's like your first ODA, nothing's like your first team. That might not be factual for everybody, but for me, like that was that was it. That's where I experienced everything I wanted to experience in SF was with three 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 three. Um, all those all those times, and we we're so tight and so close. Um, and then just we experienced so much loss. We just started going our own ways. It's super sad, but it happens to every team. Um, and then I went to one four and, uh, I didn't want to get close cause I'd lost all my guys on three, three. Um, so, and, and by that time also, like as soon as I got one four, there was a ton of new guys. So by the time I got the alpha gun, there's maybe only three or four dudes on that team that I've known and, um, yeah. and all that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's. It, it is what it is. You know what I mean? You experience loss and you deal with it. Each loss is different. I know when Mike uh, Cathcart died on one four on my fourth trip, I definitely mourned for that way different than my other um, teammates. And um, yeah, so I guess we just get into trip four, I guess, right? Let's do it. Yeah, man. So um, trip four on one four um, on a free fall team, obviously. And we got. I mean, so we had been doing a training to get level one qualified. We're like, hey, we're going to free fall, right? No one's going <laughs> to no do that. Again. So I think RRD did it and maybe some CAC dudes or something. Yeah. But like as a free fall team deploying to Afghanistan, you got your shoes with you just in case, right? <laughs> They're going to call us. Uh, yeah, just in this. case, you know. Um, anyways, so um, super connected trip. We were at the eighth sock at Camp Shank, Dalkey. Um, so all of these deployments, so I guess my first trip, I was at Moorhead. Uh, national mission force of any province. Second trip um, was the VSL mission, but still inside of it, right next to Eight Sock uh, in Shank, Logar area. And then third deployment, obviously, Minnesota. And then fourth, right there again. Right. So my, all my deployments were basically around Logar, Wardak, Syedabad, Kabul, except for when I was doing the national mission force stuff. Um, so in eight in uh 2014 was my fourth trip. Kunduz uh province north Afghanistan was overrun. Um we were kind of relinquishing what we were doing. We were giving ANA more power to do stuff. It wasn't working. Some convoys got hit up north, all their guns, 50 cal mob deuces, trucks, and everything was taken. Oh. Um, so they took 
I think every single sock in Afghanistan, uh, Commando Kandak South and East and North, and pushed all of us up into Kunduz. So we had one, so it was us, 3314, um, another Alpha Company team, and probably three ODAs from Charlie Company. So probably five ODAs staged. I think it was a CIA uh, base a long time ago. It was like an old mud clot airfield. And uh, we started running operations right out of that old mud airfield. And we were doing them multiple times per day. That's when uh, one of my mentors, Chuck Ritter, has he been on this podcast, by the way? If not, no. we'll, Chuck we'll have to get that going. Um, he ended up getting shot for like the a millionth time um, on his millionth trip there um, on the bird, the lift before us. And um, then we're going into our company sergeant major telling us about this target. So um, this particular mission, we knew we were we were in a further than we had been in before, um, just because we'd got all the JSOC target packages um, and all that. And Dan, our company sergeant major, who was at the unit for a long time, had come in and told us, hey, this is a hot village. We've hit this thing multiple times in the last few years. Um, be careful. Um, and then we got the Intel brief. The Intel brief was a little bit dramatic, like I had seen before, but my new guys don't know that. So they're thinking, you know, 50 to whatever enemy on target. I think our package was three Chinooks. You could probably fit, you know, well, I mean, <laughs> textbook answers probably do like 30 guys. Yeah. So there's been times where you put 50. Matter of fact, on my first deployment, we were going up to like 9,000 AGL. And so we'd lift and then like the weight, I guess the pilots were like, no, nope. we can we take a couple of guys off the ramp. Yeah. Oh, no, maybe a couple more. All right, we're good. And then we take yep. off. So I'm talking pack to the max. Um, yeah. So Goldbog Village and Kunduz. So we're getting ready. And I'm telling, you know, all my guys like, listen, this, this Taliban offensive in this province has been going on for a couple of weeks. Like most of the civilians are probably not in there. You should be really concerned with. And when you see running around, like they might be enemy, like don't be afraid to engage, right? Like the ROE is here, know your ROE, understand it. Um, so we had a couple PJs attached to us, um, a couple other attachments from ODAs, the full three shift package, full stacked support, obviously. Um, so we're flying in and just like any other half, uh, helicopters all for us. Got your music in, you know, I forget exactly what I was listening to, but that that mission in particular, concerning all my other experience and kind of looking around the helicopter, I felt like like maybe we didn't have the experience level yet. And mind you, our CANDAC at the time, um, we were operating with a green cycle company that we had not trained yet. So like we had been training with other companies, and so this is a whole new group. Um so we land, operations going on. We get the call to go out to Goldbach Village. Um, and I got all the our all the information on it for you. Um, we roll in, and then my HLZ is on the east side of the village. We got another helicopter that lands in the south and another one in the north. The village is not that big. Uh, maybe like a square half mile or something like that. Nothing crazy, maybe 50 to 75 structures in there. And so as soon as I get off, we're in an open field. The only cover is like the buildings, right? So we're heading straight over there. As soon as the ramps drop, I get all my guys right outside the bird, get a little tactical patience, which I learned on the board <laughs> one, and uh, some situational awareness. And I see my PJ come off the side and he's got his star up and he just starts dumping. And I'm like, what the hell? So I'm looking and I'm like, what are you shooting at, dude? What are you shooting at? And he's like, dude, Squirter, off the objective, AK-47, he's down. As soon as I'm looking at him, I look back up at the wall and I'm seeing this compound. And not all the time, but sometimes if you get the light right, you can see reflection off PBS uh, 14s or 15s or, or some like not night vision devices. So I look up over this and I can see a couple of night vision devices looking back at me. And I'm like, I don't think the other birds have landed yet. These aren't my guys. So I get on the radio. I'm like, they've got nods. They've got nods. And all of a sudden, everything opens up. We're hearing gunfire from the other side of the village. People are opening up from over here. At this point, I'm head down. I got my guys and I'm running to the nearest cover. So as soon as we get up against a wall, 
I got my, it's a ground reference guide that I carry on my sleeve here. So it's basically overhead imagery of all the buildings. So I can tell what building I'm at. And I'm like, okay, I think I'm at this building. I'm going to go ahead and start clearing, you know, building whatever to whatever. Good to go. I've got probably six ANASF guys and two commandos with me. And we moved down this hallway and the, the village is tiered. It's almost like a bowl almost. So there's like tier croppings going down the center. And there's a, a, a mud wall and I can hear something on the backside. So I'm like kind of creeping up to the wall and I've got a uh, scar heavy on me and I put it under retention on my armpit and I'm looking over this wall. So my gun is barrel pointed down, right? I look over and there's two straight up. They're the most Terry looking dudes I've ever seen in my life. BDU camo jackets, laced up boots, AK 47s, long hair, you know what I mean? Oh, and they see me, they look up and they start booking it. They probably got 20, 30 feet to get, jump over another wall. So I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Like how perfect could this be? <laughs> so I bring my gun up and it hits the wall. And I'm like, boom, I'm like, no. I pull it up and as they're like about to jump over the wall, I just unload on these dudes and um, end up finding out that I got both of them later. I think I probably got one. And so, but at this point, like they're off objective, my buildings are this way. So I just call it up. We ended up finding their bodies later. And um, they were the only, we, we pucked a uh, person under control. Um, we pucked probably like 50 dudes on the objective. No cell phones had uh, SIM cards. Uh, uh, IMEIs were all scratched off, all that stuff, except for these two dudes that I got within the first five minutes. I'm not sure what Intel was picked up from that but um anyways so that happens we ended up moving around and um i think probably like five minutes later the main assault force had they had bypassed maybe six or seven buildings to get to the main target structure so we had the other helicopter um assault force was gonna clear the buildings that the main assault force went past to get to the target structure um, as soon as they made it into the target compound, I think that their Afghans um, had slowed down. So it was only my junior Echo and her senior Charlie in the compound. And as they were coming through, there was a spider hole um, in the wall. And from what I know, uh, Mike Cathcart, or senior Charlie, was walking by in one single shot in the uh, accident pocket, which is the worst place to get hit. Um, there's nothing you can do for it. So we got that call from my junior who was a uh, American down, American down. Charlie one's been hit. Um, at this point, I'm trying to figure out where they're at. So I got a Navy or not Navy, uh, Army UD guy with me. And previously, uh, a couple hours before the mission, we'd been building spider jars, just like blow through walls and all that. And so I was like, dude, we got probably five walls between us and Mike. Like, I think we got two decent spider charges we can get through two of them but then like we gave our position away and we still got three walls to get there so i made a determination not to blow that luckily it was a good one because mike was already dead um at this time we didn't know um yeah. so me army eod guy our six um afghans we fish our way through the maze and end up getting to mike's position uh, our PJ at the time and our other 18 Delta had already been working on him. I didn't inquire about his status, um, but we needed to clear out an HLZ, right? And so our HLZ was the only one that I knew of um, that I could get to um, at the time. So me and some Afghan National Armor Special Forces guys established a corridor by ourselves um, to get all the way out to this village, encountered three more Islamic militia of Uzbekistan fighters. Um, took them out in a close range um, and then established the HLZ for the bird to come in. And mind you, it's like a 50 man, you know, uh, parade through this village getting through here while enemy is still going. So we got an extremely vulnerable element trying to get a body, you know, out through here. And then as soon as, soon as we established the HLZ, I asked. And uh, Adrian, our PJ, was like, yeah, we, we never established a pulse when we first got going. So 
Unfortunately, our one of our 18 Deltas got on the bird with and still performing CPR. They were still trying to do something, you know what I mean? So we're down one 18 Delta. Um, and for some reason or another, our ground force commander decided to call it quits right there. And then um, we got out, but uh, super duper hectic. Um, that's the one mission we're ended up getting the Valor Award for, um, for clearing the HLZ in that corridor and taking those guys out. But um, that one of two guys, I still remember this to this day, getting on the birds and flying back. The the airfield, this old you know CIA airfield is like gravel for days. It was probably a 300 meter sprint from the birds just to get the field surgical theme tent. Oh. And, that. and I remember just crying. I'm gonna like, oh, I'm getting curious thinking about it. Um, I remember running and just bawling my eyes out because I didn't know, you know what I mean? And so as soon as uh, we like got close to the field surgical team tent, all the nurses came out and like hugged us and we, we like knew, you know? Uh, so you, you were running there to get to find out what had happened. Yeah. Yeah. So all the nurses, so all the nurses that were at the field surgical team were stationed at our cop. So like we, they all knew Mike, like uh, all hung out together at night, you know, and all that stuff. So <clears throat> super tragic. Um, the team didn't do good with it. Um, but after that, it was, it was kind of a replay of, of the 2011 thing. Obviously, we tried to, to get revenge, but the Kundus mission, the bad guys that got Mike Rubb and Kundus, you know, we're going back to Logar. You know, so it's like, obviously, we, we affected the area really well. Um, there was a lot of EKA on target from all the operations that happened, but then the rest of the trip, we really came together as a team a little bit better. I think that one instance brought us together. What, what happened with ODA 3333, uh, happened again with 3314. Unfortunately, it took another death to, to get that unit cohesion and to get the mindset right. Right. So like, and I was pissed. So there was. When I saw the the group, because as I established the HLZ, that whole combo was coming to me, right? And they had all the pups, the uh, the guys that we pulled off the objective. And oh, dude, twenty or thirty of these guys were clearly fighters, tied up boots, camouflage, chest rigs next to them when they were handcuffed. Jeez. And it's like, yeah. So I was just flabbergasted and super upset that these guys were alive. Yeah. Um, they had every right within the ROE to take them out. Um, and then after that, I think that everyone felt bad about how that mission went. And then every subsequent mission after that, it was how it should be. So um, let, let me ask you this, Eric. So you mentioned like the emotions overcome you once you get back on the ground, right? Yeah. Are you having, do you even have to have any internal dialogue once you find out he's injured on the objective to just like keep it out of your mind so you're not focused on it or, or is yeah, it just yeah. an instinct so now on the objective um you'll have like little moments where you're like yeah shit i hope he's okay like man he might be dead like wow you you don't think about that because you know you could be next really yeah. um but i think i knew he was dead but i didn't want to admit it and so that's why I was sprinting for so long. Um, and it's like, even while I was sprinting, I was like, the, the in, internal dialogue, it's like, you know, he's dead. Like, why are you trying to get there to see it? Yeah. You know? And, um, golly, man. Yeah, his some tough stuff. But um, yeah, Mike was, Mike was, uh, his, he wrote a speech. Matter of fact, <clears throat> He was, uh, his fiance was in country. So his fiance was a contractor for Molson Air. Molson Air was the uh, civilian Chinook contractor that would do all the resupply. She was at a JBAD. And um, we ended up flying up to JBAD to tell her. He had the, golly, dude, what are you doing to me, <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> um, yeah, he had the ring on him. And no way. And you're probably sitting around at night talking about like, hey, when you get married, where are we going for your bachelor yeah. party? And yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, you know, super stellar individual. He's one of those guys that like on his memorial, like he had written stuff to 
um, his fiance. And the stuff that he wrote was like super profound that every special operator should hear. It's, and it helped me. He said, and we, and we said this because we named our, uh, our gym after him at, at Three Beat Down. And uh, he wrote a letter to us today. My time in special forces and my time in special operations did not define me, which is, which is so contrary to most people because yeah. I have a hard time seeing who I am without the green gray. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Mike, Mike was like, if you never, um, you never know, you'd never know he was an SF guy. And so from that point forward, my ego and everything about me completely changed. It was, yeah, I'm an SF guy, right? Like, this is what I do, but it's not who I am. Like, there's more to me than this, you know? And uh, I think that's one of the things that really helped me transition out was really understanding, like, yeah. just because you're leaving that SF world and you're leaving that warrior world, um, that doesn't mean, like, you're gone. You, you just, you, you are that person that you are before you were SF. Like the man that you know, made you who you are was there all along, you know, just because you went through these experiences, that's not who you are, you know? And, um, yeah, it was just super powerful. And now whoever I talk to that might, that might need to hear that, like should, you know what I mean? Combat does yeah. something to everybody and hopefully it's something good. Man. I mean, and we're coming up on Memorial day, obviously. Yeah. How well, May 29th was the ID attack. So every Memorial Day, I, yeah. You know. Is there any, like, do you do anything specific on that day, Eric? Um, Not so much anymore. When I was at Bragg, obviously the Memorial Walk, um, hanging out with the boys, but the team, the ODA, we text each other every year. Yeah. Uh, see how we're doing um, and all that. And obviously I'll, I'll throw back a couple IPAs from Mike and I'll throw back a couple other whiskey drinks from the other guys. But other than that, you know, it's, it's not, uh, I was talking to my wife actually before we got on and I was like, you know, I don't know how I feel about talking about this. Like I talk about it, you know, at bars and all that. Yeah. Um, but, but actually divulging it, I don't know how fun it is, you know, and how much I want to do it more after this, but, um, it's good at the same time, even though it hurts, like talking about it keeps it relevant. One of the big things my wife tells me is why did you write anything down? Why did you do anything like that? And if I don't talk about it, I lose it. And yeah. that's, that's a bigger fear of mine. It's a bigger fear of me to not remember all these emotions, even though how painful they are. How tragic would it be to forget what you felt like in that situation? Man, that I just just recently interviewed a Korean War vet. Um, he's not doing well now. Like, And I'm talking in the span of a month. Mm -hmm. um, and his family just reached out and was like, Hey, we're so glad that you had him on here. Um, he, he had never talked about these things and he just needed somebody else who, you know, somebody else who had been in the military to kind of share this with, and his family got to hear it as a result. And if not, you know, he would have gone to his grave and his grandkids, great grandkids never would have heard any of this. So, yeah. And, and to be honest, that is, that's the tragic part, you know, there's, yep. Everyone thinks like, hey, if I write about this stuff or if I take pictures of me, you're like not cool or you're a loser or something. No. Nah. One of my biggest regrets is not writing about it, taking more photos. I say that all videos. the time, man. All the time. Hey, man. Like, man, imagine the, the content. <laughs> oh. So look, but, man, I'm going to get you out of here in a second, Eric, because I've taken you way longer than I promised. Sure. Um, I just, three things I wanted to ask you. One is... And you may have already talked about this, but when you think back to like one of the most courageous things you witnessed, I feel like you you probably aged twenty years in in a four year span. Like that's a lot to go through at that age in your life. But as you think about like what what is one of the most courageous things you witnessed or heard about when you were downrange? Um. So courage, uh, courage and stupidity run a fine line. <laughs> fair, fair <laughs> enough. Take it, take it either way. <laughs> So I've seen a lot of really stupid stuff that in retrospect can be looked at very courageous, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, to be honest though, the, the, big, the two things that stand out to me, one maybe more on the stupid side um, that ended up being super courageous um, from an American. And the biggest one is actually not from an American, it's from an Afghan. 
Um, the, the American would be the, uh, the thermobaric grenade into that sniper position all alone. Yeah. And no one went with him. Um, you had SF guys a few hundred meters away with like a bunch of guns pointed at you to make sure if someone comes out, maybe we'll, we'll be able to help you. But being that long walk all the way up there by yourself, I mean, you'd have two AWT gun shift go Winchester and a 2000 Panther and he's still shooting like. I'd be I'd be warming them up real quick to throw it. Gonna get some some range. I've got video of it um, wow. of, of him doing that, and uh, yeah, so that that took some guts for sure because it wasn't needed. Like we could have sent an Afghan, maybe I don't know, maybe, yeah. maybe they would get lost. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but the most courageous thing I'd say is is an Afghan um, uh, on multiple occasions. Um, some of these Afghans are interpreters specifically. I think our level three local national interpreters do not get enough credit. And I think that their impact on special operations is evident in how many SF dudes went to go get these guys out of that. Yeah, place. that's you such a I mean? great point. Like they, th these guys are some of the most courageous individuals ever. So in particular... So we were hitting objectives and we couldn't get overwhelming support by fire. So we ended up getting all of our gun trucks um, on this line to uh, do support by fire over this objective. And one of our Afghans, uh, there was another Afghan wounded. Um, and we're like, listen, he's done. Like after the gunfight's over, we'll go in there and get him. We're not gonna go in here and risk any more lives. Like this is not feasible, right? Security first, okay? One of our interpreters volunteered to get on one of our razors, or Polar's razors, and drive underneath our support by fire, like feet underneath, park it, grab the guy, put him on the back of the razor, and drive back to us. And that's exactly what he did. So under 50 cal fire feet, I'm talking like feet above him, he was like, on this little razor, all the way this thing is a, a wiped out, I think he was part of our, our militia force, so at this time, we we weren't able to get anyone to, like, fight with us. So, like, we had finally got some guys. One of them was injured, and we're like, are we going to leave? If we leave them, like, we're never going to get anybody. Our interpreter got on that thing, drove out there, and rescued his ass underneath our support fire and brought him back. Um, completely did not need to do that at all um, because he's got no vested interest in the success of this mission besides, obviously, his, his family. But his family has already been killed. Um, so it's like he had no reason to do that, just straight courage um, that he brought up from somewhere to do it. And from to this point, we're still friends with him. That's um, awesome. Absolutely incredible guy. Did he get out, Eric, or no? Uh, he did get out. Yeah, I think he's in Turkey. Awesome. Yeah. Um, something I like to ask everybody is, is there anything you carried with you downrange that, you, somebody, that somebody gave you? sentimental value good luck charm that you just wanted to have nearby yeah there's a few things that i got in my safe that i was able to get over um lots of knives that were made for me from afghanistan from afghanis um jewelry you know stuff like that's really cool um rugs that are especially made for me. there's a lot of stuff like that. um yeah in particular all of them are special to me all of them got a, a special place in my heart but nothing that somebody in the U.S. gave you, like your mom, brother, picture of well, something. Yeah, so there was a Bible, actually. Um, there was a Bible, and uh, I think it was my best friend at the time had highlighted sections in the Psalms that were very, wow. very combat-oriented, and I used it. So before every mission, my team would hold hands, and I would pull out that Bible and find a highlighted section, and I'd read the verse before we go. No out. way. Yep. Yeah, I still got it. That's cool. That's cool. Did you carry that with you outside the wire that stayed at the... Uh, depending on how far I was walking. <laughs> yeah. Shed some <laughs> weight. On a truck, it'd be in my backpack. If I was walking the mountains, it'd be back home. So. Got it. All right. Um, and then the last question, uh, again, like you saw a lot in just four years and, and, and probably more outside of that with training and free fall and everything else you all do. Um, as you look back, would you go back and do that again? 100%. No doubt about it. Um Although a lot of it was tragic, um, I've got my little girls who just come in right now um, to think about. And I don't want to know who I would be 
without those experiences. I love where I am now. Got an absolutely amazing family, wife, three baby girls, incredible friends, a great history to think back on. And um, if I could do it all over again, I would. Obviously, things that keep me up at night, I wish I could do things differently and made some better decisions. Maybe some guys would still be here. Um, but, you know, their families right now are doing great as well. You know, they've moved on and they're graduating high school and been doing good things. So, did I hear you say you have three girls? Three girls. Yeah. Matter of fact, all of them are under the age of four. <laughs> man. Yeah. So it's a combat zone here every day. You got more exciting <laughs> times coming, man. All right. Yeah. Eric, man, I'm, I'm so thankful for the time. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about what you're working on now or, or yeah, so any? If I could plug, so the National Medal Army Please. stuff, and it kind of ties into, I think you said it best, the individuals that you're surrounding yourself with and that there's more to you than just your experiences. Um, obviously I'm with gridersports.com right now. We're a partner with the National Medal of Honor Museum. We'll be doing some stuff with them and Daryl here shortly. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's this company that I'm a part of right now. Obviously we're an outdoor sports, um, and, and shooting company, but what it comes down to, it really is about the individuals itself. And that's what we tie ourselves with, you know, major private training organizations like Blue Bearing, you know, Kyle Morgan's company, Phil Crash Revival, um, Allegiance, um, some of the top names in the country that are PTOs, private training organizations, where your spot, um, where your your spot that you got friends that can help you make a living and support your small business. Um, and the National Mount of Honor Museum stuff that's going to be dropping will keep you in the loop and stay tuned. That's awesome. I'm. I'm I I can just sense it in your voice, the way you're saying it. it's going to be cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eric. I really appreciate the time and, and sharing all these stories with us. And I know it's not easy to do. So, man, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Anytime. I appreciate what you do. Just bring the message to the people. So keep it up. Man. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. This one reminded me of another one we did recently with Rob Huberty, a former SEAL, uh, who's gone on to do some amazing work in the private sector. So I just wanted to read a few comments from that interview. Um, we have one from Mike Goodwin, a subscriber, longtime subscriber here, and he says, another great interview. I hope he, Rob, makes a difference with Zero Eyes, his company. I'm so sick of thoughts and prayers and reading more about kids being killed. Amazing that Timothy Leary might have been onto something. That sure isn't what my dad was telling me as a kid. Then again, everything in moderation. And of course, if you listen to the to the interview, Huberty's company, Zero Eyes, is trying to detect and alert on uh, weapons in schools and different public areas to avoid shootings altogether. So it's a great cause that he's working towards. Then Greg B mentions in the comments, another awesome interview, Mr. Fugit, your questions, your style are excellent. Allowing Rob to tell the story of the incident that Everett perished without interruption, as some interviewers typically do, and causes the storyteller to lose some, some track of their thoughts. He, in effect, put me right there, and the follow-on story of his commander's mental decline right before the squad and company's eyes, ultimately taking his life in country, OMG. How tragic, no matter how much that person may have been despised. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's, I mean, Huberty has seen a lot, and the way he tells it, um, obviously, Obviously, you know, he, he said he didn't particularly care for this person, but he still told it with um, some deference and understanding of what it meant and some learnings that he took away from it. So it was a very powerful set of, of stories. And then lastly, Mark Sullivan, another subscriber, which greatly appreciate. He says, great follow-up questions to an articulate guest, one of your finest interviews. Uh, so thank you, all of you, for taking the time to leave these comments. Thank you for subscribing. Um, that helps us get additional guests on here. It helps get this out to more people, and we can't do it without you. And I'm glad you see these the same way that I do and, and find the interest in them. So thank you so much, and y'all stay safe.